Thanks for joining us at the Clive Barker Podcast. You can subscribe or follow anywhere you get audio or on the YouTube channel. Then never miss a release. In episode 314, Jose and Ryan are joined by Ed and Nina of Synobium to talk with Jeff Portis, a legend of image animation behind Hellraiser 1 and 2, Nightbreed, as well as some cult favorites like Highlander, Return to Oz, Children of Dune, The Life Force, and Crawl. Uh, this episode is available in video on YouTube or audio in the podcast feed. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of his proceeds will support the program where artist Don Bertram's volunteers monthly. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and celebrates and continues to be inspired by his art. He uses that inspiration to help kids through the Texas Children's Cancer Center and we couldn't be more thrilled to continue to work with him. There's a news feature video that shows Don working with the kids at Texas Children's Cancer Center and his artwork. Click the side banner at www.clivebarkercast.com to find links to the video and his Etsy shop where you can buy his prints, books, and support this wonderful program. Check out his most recent shared painting, Sky Egg, homage to Barker from his Etsy shop. With us today, we have, of course, Ryan and uh, uh, Ed and Nina. Or from yeah, yeah, yeah. Or evening. Yeah. Depending on where you are. Yeah. And uh, today we have a very special guest, right? We have uh, uh, Jeff Portis. Let me read the intro on the uh, the uh, uh, London Yay! Fashion College. It says <laughs> Jeff Portis is an associate lecturer on this course. Jeff began working in the film industry in 1983, had his big break on Hellraiser in 1985, where he was supervisor for effects and designed and created the Pinhead Cenobite. Jeff has worked on various movies such as Highlander, Gladiator and Nightbreed. Wow. He has also worked on countless commercials and various long running shows, Scratchy and Company and Alistair McGowan's Big Impression, supervising prosthetic makeup. And there's a lot of stuff missing here, but we'll get into that, right? I don't know if you help too much. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome. Thanks, thanks for joining us uh, thanks, today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Are you still coming uh, to us from the turret? Uh, no. Okay. We moved from the turret about five, six, uh, six years ago. Okay. So where, where are you right now? Are you in London? Um, we're about three or four miles south of that. Still in Norfolk in England. Norfolk, okay. Um, okay. Sort of like the driest, the driest and un uncomfortably hottest place. Well, okay, I'm, I'm British. So the thing is uncomfortably hot for us is, is 25 degrees. So <laughs> I'm, I know you've all said various things, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very hot and very muggy here at the moment. It keeps mm. intermittently raining and hailing and everything. Oh, wow. And, uh, Norfolk, if you know where it is, it's that bulge on the right-hand side of England. Um, just before the sort of like the North Sea, so to speak. And it's it's well known as being, it's probably about the driest place in the country because all the, the, the wet storms come up from across the Atlantic. So Cornwall gets hit first and they're the wettest place in the country, one of them, Wales and Ireland. Mm -hmm. By the time it gets to us, there's nothing left. So we really get snow here about once in a blue moon. And wow. uh, the rainstorms, et cetera, the only times we get really heavy stuff is when we get the opposing winds coming down the North Sea. And then we get flooded. And we're one of those places in the country that when the big flood comes, we'll be the first to go. There'll be nothing left of us. Yeah, right. Geez. Yeah. I mean, here in Ohio, they keep joking that you can get all four seasons in the same day. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can understand that. But uh, yeah. I, I used to live in Arizona for five years. and I just love the desert. I love the dry heat and, you know, yeah. the, just going through, you know, the big uh, Mojave Desert and California and all that stuff to me is just amazing. And I grew up by the Atlantic. I grew up in North Portugal in a little town with a beach and, you know, population triples every summer and lots of British people come over and, you know, uh, French people and whatever. So that's great. So, uh, you know, what it's like as well. I mean, South Portugal, I mean, it's, it's as green as anything. You cross the border into Spain and it just suddenly goes brown all of a sudden. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's always I that, mean, that I, weird thing. Yeah, especially in uh, the southern southern part of Spain, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with, like, uh, um, you know, uh, Benidorm, uh, Alicante and all those places in the Alicante, Mediterranean. Alicante, Alicante I love, and we spend a lot of time down towards Alicante, towards Almeria, et cetera, et cetera. Seville, I adore, which is one, yeah. one of my favorite places in Spain. And yeah. we have friends near Faro in Portugal and things like that. So we've been oh, across yeah, in the south, in Algarve. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I did my master's in Alicante, so mm -hmm. it was amazing to spend the whole day in the lab. And then at the end of the day, 
just, you know, I, I was living just 200 yards away from the beach and I was just yeah. going to the beach and it was it's just a lovely, It's a lovely town. It's a lovely yeah. town. It's a great restaurants and bars and it's got a really nice, slightly sort of faded Victorian glory to it on that seafront. Oh, it lovely. sure does. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'd like to, you know, have our viewers know a little bit more about the artist. I mean, they know a lot of stuff about you and, and, and about the makeups that you created over the years and image animation. It's always, uh, an integral part of, uh, at least, you know, for the people who are familiar with mostly with Clyde Barker stuff, you know, Nightbreed and Hellraiser one and two and all that stuff. But, um, but so, um, so how did you first start? getting interested in in special effects where did you uh did you grow up in leicester or or in no, london um, i grew up in a small town uh, but, um quirky um i was born not particularly far from where i am now so about 50 or 60 miles west in a town called whole beach mm -hmm. my folks went to a seaside town called skegness which not many people talk about in in lincolnshire and then i lived most of my life in a place called boston which is the original Boston that all of the Bostons stem from. We right. have our own sort of Pil Pilgrim Fathers, all that kind of thing, et cetera, et cetera. It went over at the same time as the Mayflower. And it's a, it's a fairly, it was back in the day, about 100 years ago, a very, very busy sea fishing port. And then it became a big uh, port for trade and things like that. Um, it has, um, if you look it up, it has the tallest parish church in the country called the Boston Stump. Oh. which is famous for being built on the banks of the river. And when they got about halfway up the tower, it's three, it is literally 365 steps to the very, very top, which I was lucky to have been to as a schoolboy because the vicar took us up there um, as a class thing. Most people can only go about two thirds of the way up. <laughs> if you look very carefully at this massive tower, it's absolutely huge. It is actually slightly, um, do you understand wonky? It slightly bends in the middle in the sense that when they got halfway up, they realized it was falling into the river. So had to shore up the riverbanks and then built backwards. It's only the tiniest bit, but you can just see from the inside a slight bend where the pillars had to be bent backwards to stop it falling into the river. Wow. But it's, um, it's a nice, it's a, it's a rather nice town. It's in the middle of, again, where, where we are now, it's reclaimed land. It's called Fenlands. Mm -hmm. um, Lincolnshire is vast, vast areas of flatlands, perm, tulips, and that kind of thing, but all reclaimed from the sea. So eventually, if the way things are going now, it will go back to the sea in about the next 50 years. Sounds um, like little Netherlands or something. It's the particular part of Lincolnshire I come from is called Holland. Okay, there you so go. So it's mm. divided into three sections and ours. We, we mm. grew tulips, we had windmills, we had dikes, and it's called Holland. Wow. So we didn't wear clogs, so that was the one thing. <laughs> um, but, um, At least not in public. Yes. <laughs> But it was a lovely place, and I just grew up there. Um, my, I, I get if any, if if I have artistic abilities, they probably came from my my late mother, um, mm. who used to like to have bits and pieces coloring in, etc. But I'm of a generation, and she was of a generation where, at 13, she left school and went to work, mm. and came from a small town just in the middle of the Fenlands, etc. So I was lucky enough then when I went to school, I did lots of drawing and things like that. And by the time I got to what we have secondary schools when I was 11 to 17, 18, I went to a grammar school in Boston, which was a sort of a it's very old grammar school. It's got a, a, a charter given to us by King John, I think it was the same time as the Magna Carta, um, all that kind of stuff, lots of history and things like that. And I had a brilliant art teacher called Mr. Grimble who was uh, involved in the design of the bouncing bomb in the Second World War. Oh, wow. He worked in the art department there. He was a fabulous character, nicknamed Banger Grimble. And he was called Banger because he used to um, intimidate his pupils by, you know, the cardboard tubes that you buy prints and, and roll. Sure, paint yeah. Roll. He used to bang them very hard on the desk. Um, to wake people up. Yes, but not me because I was fast. Because he, he was a wonderful person. He was just such a lovely, lovely man. Mm -hmm. And he got me through to my O levels at 15 and then had to retire. He passed on about, I think, about 10, 15 years ago. And he was just a fascinating character. Um, and I just loved drawing and painting. He, he encouraged me to sculpt, to paint, to do different things, to try mm -hmm. different stuff, and just let me get on with my own stuff at the back of the room. I was the SWAT in the art room. And then I had another teacher with my A levels. And I would say so. So this dates me. I, I, I'm I'm 61 and proud of it. 62 next January. Um, but the thing is that in 1969, a film called 2001: A Space Odyssey came out, and I'd always been into sort of science fiction and fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. There was a magazine called um, Speed and Power, 
that basically serialized lots of the short stories of Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke in the back every every week. Mm -hmm. uh, I got into reading science fiction and then got into a few other authors. And when 2001 came out, I basically went to see it about three times and just absolutely loved it and just got yeah. it straight away. And so just developed a love of, of horror and fantasy and science fiction. Back in those days is the thing is you're talking late 60s, the Hammer films were still being made. So the thing is that you couldn't, well, I couldn't see them at nine years old in the cinema, but at the same time, um, you could watch older ones on the TV. Mm -hmm. And TV then, um, as the two or three channels we had, used to show these movies late at night on Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah. So I would, I would watch them. We didn't have video recorders. We didn't, we barely had colour TV back in, what, 68, 69, when we first sure. got colour TVs. So I used to watch them and just love them. And I just sort of dreamed of sort of creating something similar. So my first forays into it were I got hold of and still have an original copy of Dick Smith's Monster Makeup Handbook um, from mm. an original, the original printing. The cover's a little bit tatty, but it's still up there. Possibly worth yeah, something. I got them. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the so, do-it-yourself, uh, uh, well, it, do-it-yourself. I mean, it I've got so many people I know, you know, they started Monster off with makeup. Because it, it, yeah. was, it was stuff that you had ping pong ball string yeah. pda glue that kind of stuff yeah I don't know what I would do. This works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm looking yeah. at uh, i'm looking right now at one of the uh, pages uh, telling you how to do the new frankenstein monster yeah and uh, i have to say it looks just like frank it's a skin yeah. person and they're showing how to make the muscles and the, yeah. the veins and all that it's stuff skeleton. yeah it, it didn't move i mean i didn't do that one but they didn't move because obviously they're using materials that aren't as flexible and as, as scientifically wonderful as the stuff we have now or they have right. now yeah but the thing is it's just sort of like i would i would sit there and i would do i would um, when my grandma was over if she fell asleep in the afternoon i'd do an acid burn on her arm <laughs> and things like that you know to have people and just practice bits and pieces sure and then i also moved on to my um we we call them action man you have uh, gi joe dolls mm -hmm. i had an old action man for when i was a kid yeah, yeah. and i used a thing called blue tack which is that stuff you stick pictures on walls with the po posters oh, yeah. and stuff yeah That's yeah it. i used to just warm that up in my fingers and i've got i've still got the pictures somewhere i have to try and find them of my action man made up as the mummy and frankenstein's monster and a werewolf and things that i sculpted and painted onto him Royal yeah. Craft you know. <laughs> yes, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, sort of Thunderbirds special effects makeups, that kind of stuff. But, <laughs> yeah, um, so you were you were like just... kit bashing before you even knew what yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. And then go on to kit bashing as well. My other passion, of course, was the science fiction, was the model making. So I started basically buying model kits and saying, I don't want to follow the instructions and playing with those. Or I took my old model kits mm -hmm. and changed them and repainted them. And so by the time I got through towards really my school days, so I, I did my A-levels in art, and that was my art and stuff. I was still building things. Um, by the time dinosaurs, I got through the Your dinosaurs. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I did, I did. Well, I, went to, I then went to university in Leicester and did a degree in graphic design, which is in those days, the thing is that you didn't have the, the, the plethora of choices of art-based courses that you do now. Right. And it's fine art or graphics. Yeah. And so you went arts. into marketing and commercials or you went well, into fine arts and became a starving artist. Yeah, I, I, exactly. Fine art. I always said fine art comes from the heart. Graphics comes from the head. Mm. And that was the two. It was still art. And so, you know, we did photography and my art master said Leicester, the best Leicester Polytechnic or University as it was as, as it was then. Polytechnic. Yeah. Um, he said it's the best place because they have a they had an enormous dark room photography studio. We used to do you know, photography. They have four or five studios, a fabulous AV lab, and things like that. So I did three years there, and after a year of doing the basics, I went into specialisations. So as I then mentioned, I got my I did my dinosaur video. I did um, animated dinosaurs out of plasticine. Mm -hmm. I did a love few animation it. contests. Love it, love it. <laughs> um, and then I'd also built at home, I'd taken all the kits I'd ever bought, smashed them into pieces and built about a five foot long spaceship model on a, a wooden base with all these bits. And there was everything from Battlestar Galactica to Space 90. There was everything on there. Oh man, I just have a 1999, uh, Space 1999 uh, Eagle right there that I need to finish. And, uh, uh, I, I yeah. know exactly where the Eagle bits were actually on that. So I, th th there was everything on there because you couldn't, I mean, I couldn't afford all those fabulous Tamiya kits, all those nice little details that they use on the models or the models there. Hey, 
Sure. So yeah. I just I kit bashed from what I had and added bits and pieces, and mm. actually ended ended up selling that to uh, a Midlands based uh, TV production company, and they used it for one of their um, uh, children's TV shows, where an alien visits the Earth. So mm. my, my my spaceship did end up in a TV show. Oh, um, that's cool. They dropped cool. it on the floor and set fire to it. <laughs> it, did, it went did. away of all things. Oh no. Do you remember that I think at one point they found one of the ships, the space station from 2001 in a field somewhere yeah, in England? Yeah, yeah. Near Bor- I think near Boreham Wood, where you were showing me that picture the other yeah. day. It's, Completely yeah. destroyed. It's, and they, yeah, yeah. yeah. crazy. Yeah. There's, I used to love, uh, I used to love uh, Arthur C. Clarke stuff and, you know, Mysterious yeah. World and Mysterious yeah. Universe. You know, that, that was the stuff that we got in Portugal. Yeah, that um, yeah that, was, that was amazing. And we're actually oh. doing a commentary track for the horror of Dracula coming up soon from yeah. Hammer. Yeah. 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 So, and so, I love the old Hammer films. I thought, yeah. they were, I mean, apart from the red paint for the blood, which is just, you know, just okay. Kensington Gore. Um, <laughs> it's but it, it's just it, they're just wonderful because I mean Chris Lee and Peter Cushing they're all brilliant actors. You then sort of fired into sort of like your Oliver Reeds for your Curse of Your Werewolf and that kind of stuff and your Andre Morels all mm-hmm. these wonderful actors and that gorgeous sort of like really gaudy cinematography. We did yeah. the and Devil like, Rides like, Out. Like, we, did, we did the Devil Rides Out. Yeah, that, that's yeah. wonderful. That yeah, was that was great. What I remember the most from Hammer films is the the shocking revelation that they used really, really red blood. It was just bright yeah. red. It was like, just like paint. Yeah, yeah. Can it look like go. Can... But <laughs> before we get off of your your uh, background, I have to ask if you have a background in literature or grammar because of the way you totally trounced me in in uh, words with friends. It was like <laughs> you, I had no, three hundred points and you had like six hundred points. I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> No, I, I just I just cheat. I, I get a dictionary out of it. <laughs> grab some of them. Yeah, the well, truth. With, I think with that game, that's not cheating. I no. think if it was if it were Scrabble, that would be cheating. But I I I, you, I, che- I cheat when I'm playing the computer, but uh, when yeah. I'm playing people, I don't. But uh, I, I I've all, I've always liked I've always liked words. I, um, yeah. uh, from the night university used to have sort of what we call bullshitting contests, where we would sit and talk absolute rubbish with as many long real words as we could, and throw in a few strange sounding ones as well. So I've always, I've always liked I've always liked words. That's, um, all uh, right. Sorry about that, Ryan. <laughs> So you finish art school in 1982, right? That's that's uh, around 81, the time. 81. Yeah, 81. And yes. and that's when you've had at that point uh, a portfolio of about three three years work of yeah. stuff, right? Yep, first class honours degree and a portfolio of work and sort of like moved straight to London. We, we'd often um, from Leicester, which is about, it's about uh, 100, 100 miles to London, I think it is. Sure, about two hours. We'd days out to London. I love going to the city. So three or four of us said, look, OK, let's go and see what we can do. So we basically lived for about two months during the summer vacation in halls of residence for a university in London. They, they opened them out to, to rent them out so we could find a space and take it from there and find somewhere to live. Mm-hmm. And so I that we, we ended up in the Edgware Road with a couple of guys from college, etc., just looking for things for work. And um, I had a couple of bits and pieces. I went to work for um, um, Harrison Bachelor for a couple of months, uh, mm-hmm. the animation company back in the day from the 60s and 70s. And uh, they did Animal Farm, I think, back in the early 60s. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. I worked with uh, uh, John Powers. Cell Sorry? animation. Cell yes, animation. Yeah. Cell animation, yes, yeah. Um, and I worked with John Hallis for a little while. He had a, an idea back in the days of video disc. To produce uh, a coffee table art book um, of great artists, and I storyboarded a whole load of stuff for him. Oh, um, okay. Unfortunately, it didn't take off, and he died a couple of years later anyway. But um, there was that, and there was a couple of other things. And unfortunately, when I went to talk to the people at the BBC about some work, I left my portfolio on the underground station. Oh no! Never got it back. I put ads into the uh, the, like, the Evening Standard, the, the main London newspaper, saying, look, please keep the portfolio. Just let me have the pictures. Yeah. And of course, in those days, it wasn't digital. It wasn't on computers. It was photographs. Yeah. Right, right. So, so somewhere out there, yeah, somewhere out there, yeah. someone has like negatives and photos and stuff like that or, or of, of your well, early They had work. a few photos and some packs yeah. and original paintings and stuff, but I, I think so they threw it away and kept the portfolio. Yeah. He, he has his own um, negatives. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I had enough negatives and enough bits and pieces to actually cobble together. And I had a show reel because I did I did audio visual stuff. So I did lots of animation 
um, and various other things, audio visual stuff at college. So I had a show reel at least, which I could take around to show to people. And you were on your way to BBC to to try to get an interview there. I just left the BBC. They'd okay. seen my portfolio. Harrison actually didn't get to see it, and I said, oh, ah. "I'll give it to you." And luckily, he sort of trusted me, so which is yeah. quite nice. But that was that was a couple of years of sort of like you know sort of like just playing around, just trying to get things. And then it just the weird okay, so the weird story starts. I had uh, a friend. I have a friend. She still is. Who is mm -hmm. uh, a magician called Faye Presto. Mm -hmm who basically was working the uh, club and drag circuits in London. And she wanted some props made. And so I did a couple of props for her. I did a, a, a collapsible burnt skull, where mm -hmm. she puts somebody's head in a box and then pulls the, the rubber skull out. It had to collapse down so it could fit in the side. So I bought one of those joke shop things. Yeah. Started it up because she threw a flame in there. And she pulls this burning, smoking skull out. Wow. So I did that for her. And she said, look, I, she, she's very famous. She, she has a residency at a couple of London major West End clubs now for sort of rich people, etc. So they can be impressed with their magic while they're dining and things like that. And she's done big parties for lots of pop stars. Mm. And she said, look, I've got a couple of contacts in, I think, the, the Lad Corporation and a couple of other things. And she said, look, let me pass your name on. So I then get a letter um, from think there was a one I, there was terry gilliam's office wrote back and said thanks we'll let you know if there's anything wow. and then i got a letter from gary kurtz's office uh -huh. producer of star uh, wars producer <laughs> of star wars that's right yeah, yeah I think... he was working on return to Oz. So that was oh great. i love that movie oh yeah. it's such a good movie oh my god so the guys said, with the wheels the wheelies oh they, they were it? so freaky the stop yeah. motion claymation too uh, yeah. The, yeah yeah the claymation i love that i love belinda the chicken that was, was uh uh Wild what was his name? Wild Steve, Norris, yeah. Steve Norris, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Norris, yeah. Oh. Um, well, I, I went up by that. So he, Gary Kurt said, "Look, come up and see me, and we'll just get you to chat and etc. Cetera, etc." Cetera. So I chatted to him, um, and he introduced me to Lyle Conway, who was heading the mechanical and visual uh, the, the, the special effects area. And they said, "Look, we've got nothing, but we'll just sort of like you know have a wander around." Look, so I looked at the sets, talked to the wheelies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and, oh, and cool. <laughs> that was the first time I met Steve Norrington. I've known him for some years since then, yeah. worked with him a couple of times. And I just sort of like thought, well, this is okay. That was a bit dull, wasn't it? So back to back to the boring dullness of life. Had a cup of coffee in the canteen and picked up a copy of Screen International and realised they were doing a film called Space Vampires at L3 Studios. Yeah. So yeah. I thought, okay, so who's the head of special effects maker? I'm there? here. I might as well go by. <laughs> well, a man called Mick Maley. And um, so I just found out where they were and went that and knocked Yoda on his guy. Door. That Yoda guy. Yeah. So I went and knocked on his door and um, said hello and showed him my portfolio. He said, okay, interesting. And he said, okay, look, go away nicely and come back <laughs> in a couple of days' time and bring me a couple of airbrush paintings of zombies just to see, you know, just to see what I could do off the cup. Yeah. Mm. So I did. So I went away. Now I didn't have an airbrush. <laughs> um, I'd used one before, but I didn't know one personally. So I borrowed 50 right. quid bought an airbrush and did a couple of things two or three paintings of sort of like zombie type characters went back and he gave me a job and started the next week as a run, what we call a runner um so like a general dog's body come assistant mm -hmm. and that was general in a dog's past. body <laughs> very dog's body so running uh, foam and stuff uh i was doing everything it, it taught yeah. me my trade um it was it was it was it was actually sort of brain at the deep end and teaching me everything experience i got to be dan parker's assistant for applying makeups um we had um a french artist there called i think it was jack i can't remember his damn name now um who was airbrushing the zombies and he sort of did a lot with me there i was running phones in the evening i was doing mold duplication etc cetera, etc cetera, all the jobs that nobody else wanted i want and a question was... i want a question here you yep. met colin cantwell there right oh the name rings a bell isn't he the guy who sculpted um the uh, calabos makeup for uh, uh, Clash of the Titans. Oh. And, uh, he's a, uh, I'm not talking Colin Arthur. Colin Arthur, that's it. I'm yes, sorry. yeah, Colin. I didn't, I, Colin popped in. He didn't work on Life Force, but his mother, Dorothy, worked there. And Dorothy oh, was fabulous. She sculpted, Dorothy sculpted, you know, the big, at the end of Life Force, is the big bat demon comes out in yes, front of the cathedral. Yes. She I sculpted that. that. Awesome. And she was lovely. She was this. She was this little sixty-five year. She's probably long gone by now. This little sixty-five year old lady just sitting in the corner of the room sculpting a demon. 
Wow. Whereas I, was, I, was doing, I, I got to do things like bladder work and stuff on some of the stuff where all the blobs turn into uh -huh. blood, turn into Patrick Stewart and things like that. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was fun stuff, but it taught me. I, I was making foam every night. I was doing molds. I was doing everything. And when I was you, the last person those, in the office. When you made those duplication molds, you said that you'd done some clay presses. Yeah. What what method did you use for the clay press? Was it a flexible right. mold or a stone? No, 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 no. These were plaster molds. These were back in the day when we didn't do sort of really do fiberglass or any of the sort of resins that you have now. These were uh, dental plaster molds, but not what you almost go as far as dental stone, which I know you guys have in the States. Um, yeah. The dental plaster is, we have one called Christical. It's quite a firm plaster and it will take a baking, but it does tend to fall apart after a while. So what we had to do was, we did what was, it was called the clay squeeze method. And you would basically take wet clay, you would water it down into water-based clay, clay water -based. mud. Yeah, you'd then pour, um, uh, put some cling film. Um, do you guys call it as cling a barrier? Film? As a barrier, as a barrier, onto the thing. Pour the clay in, and then press the two halves of the mold together. I get it, and then retouch the sculpt afterwards. Well, uh, no, you see, what you had was then is the thing is that you'd already taken a mold of the sculpt in silicon, so you could produce loads and loads of negatives. You'd then take that squeeze and you'd then do a, po a, a positive from it, but you'd put the squeeze into the mold. It's, it's, I did it, it I, I did basically did six times for about 80 molds, 60, 70, 80 molds. Wow. And it just means you, you can never, you can never take copies of both halves because you never guarantee they'll fit because plaster just distorts very slightly. Right. So we took copies of the sculpt, the negative part of the mold, and then simply you squeeze it in that to create a new positive. So you squeeze it in and then you then peel the cling film off and then find the cutting edge and then smooth it down and then create a new positive by pouring plaster into that. Right. And with the cutting edge, retouching the sculpt and stuff. So you've got a blending edge. Right. And this was because all the zombies in that film were basically made from uh, mix and match pieces. We had about 10 noses, about 10 cheeks, about 10 chins, 10 foreheads. And what we did about for about four weeks before the start of shooting, I was with Dan, there was uh, Dave White there and various other people. And Bob we were going to Bob the, and Bob, and, Yeah, and Bob, yeah. And we were going to the makeup rooms and with the people who were going to play the zombies, we would then lightly stick using a, a mild prosade, um, say a nose on, and then say, well, those cheeks look nice with that, and then that. And then we would use a harder adhesive where they join together Mm -hmm. and then delicately just with alcohol peel the thing off and then seal it so it became a mask that just fitted that person and then you so just set that aside for the days when they were going to work well that's it so the thing is that every artist every actor had about 10 different zombies that they could wear that awesome. would literally just fit them that's great that's awesome i did stuff like that too that's that's so brilliant <laughs> It was, it's, you've got to be inventive, haven't you, on a sort of low budget. And I mean, nowadays the materials are just sort of through the roof. So it's, I wouldn't say it's easier necessarily because consumer can, can be a difficult thing to work with. But sure. in those days, you know, fun latex can be a nightmare. Yeah. Um, you know, you throw away probably more than you actually use. <laughs> you use. Wow. It's just, it's yeah. just hard. So let me see if I did my homework right. So uh, Bob Keen was, was assistant my to course. Nick Maley. Bob was, and, yeah, Nick's right. second in command. And then how did you get into Highlander? Okay, so um, Life Force, oh, sorry, Space Vampires. And mm -hmm. it should have been called Space Vampires. I'm sorry, that's a quick that's aside. Book. That was a Life Force book. is the shittiest title ever. Yeah, Space it would have Vampire. sold it a lot better, I think. I agree, <laughs> it was, yeah. It was camp and corny, for God's sakes. You know, it yeah. was perfect, <laughs> that title. But that was Canon and various other people, et cetera. They, yeah. they were never particularly humorous people at the best of time. Um, so a few months after, let's think, um, Highlander, da, 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 da. we were, I was doing, um, I was stopping at Nick's, we were doing a pregnant stomach for a man, and I was staying at Nick Maley's, <laughs> then um, <laughs> Highlander came to us, it was, it basically, I think Nick basically just got it um, based on, because he knew a producer who had been on uh, Kroll, oh, it was yeah. Nick's with Kroll work. Oh yeah, I um, love that movie. And um, so they came to us and we got the film and we, we ended up in a workshop in Docklands that's now very, very expensive flats on, on the, the south bank of London's Thames. And um, yeah, we basically got that. And we met Russell and he gave us a sort of basic idea and I so took it. To but Maley didn't, didn't stay the whole production, right? He left halfway. 
Okay, I have to be careful here. Um, okay. <laughs> um, yes, he left halfway through. Okay, gotcha. Um, there were there were things that happened. I, I think the production wasn't going particularly well. Um, um, how can I say this? Um, Nick used, we just mentioned Kroll and the old age maker he did on Francesca Annis. Nick used the same appliances on BT Edney for the old age makeup for her and they didn't work. Um, so the thing is they the came widow of the web, it. the widow of the web. Exactly. Oh, okay. And um, the thing is that what happened was is that they just didn't work. Her eyes were all over the place. It just was a mess. Yeah, she was supposed to be blind, to... like with eyes, sealed yeah. eyes. Yeah, but, but no, but that was the widow of the web, yes. But the thing is that, I mean, she had eyelids, but it just it just didn't work. So what you see in the finished film is uh, Sandra Exelby's um, stipple, old age stipple makeup effect, which stipple works fine if you've not got somebody who's about 23, 24 years old and doesn't have any sort right. of Right, no stretch right. their right. skin. You yeah. gotta stretch it, you know. You look at Titanic, the best old age stipple makeup ever by Greg Cannon, and you realize yeah. why it yeah. works because the woman's eight years old. lady to start with, which helps. Yes. <laughs> so it looks fine what it is, but um, he was not enjoying the process. And we came in one morning after they'd done a night shoot, and Bob had said that Nick had collapsed and <sighs> um, decided to go home. Um, whether that's true or not, we'll leave to. Sure. Histories of history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But he left the production then, and then we carried on. So I then assisted Bob, and they changed a couple of things. And we did. We ended up making lots of puppets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if you look carefully, if you look carefully, there's some little bits in there with the the animated ghosts at the end, mm -hmm. uh, where we did sort of various things. And I, I ended up. I remember I ended up um, copying a sculpt of Dick Smith's um, eyeless screaming ghost from Ghost Story. Do you remember that uh, one? Oh yeah, I love that. You know, with with no Alice cut, Creed, just, uh, Alice Creed, yeah. and it was just all with just the teeth and just. The, and I, I thought I loved that, so I copied oh, it. Oh yeah, no eyes and just the mouth with those broken yeah. teeth. And they did all that, and it was a great film to work on. And you know, it, it was brilliant, brilliant fun. Um, I, I I I watched Highlander one and two in preparation. <laughs> wow. uh, two is <laughs> one is and you're still here. <laughs> yeah. I, I my question uh about the second one is Why? how did you Why? How, how much Why? how much how much scenery was left after Michael Ironsides was done chewing it? <laughs> <laughs> He's the best thing in the picture. He's a lovely uh, bloke. General um, Katana. Not... I, he yeah. chooses to Siri and everything. Come on, he's he's. But that's what he does. I can't was, believe they got Sean Connery back for that. Yeah. Well, it was the whole thing was a sort of a bit of a mess from start to finish. It was one of those things. Look, the first one did well. Let's make another one. Oh yeah. 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 That's what decided to do this. Yeah. Sean Connery comes in and sort of like rewrites half the script. And believe me, what you see on the screen may look nonsensical. There, you should have seen the first script. Sure, <laughs> sure. It, it was a nightmare. <laughs> Um, but, we basically but, spent two weeks shooting. It was, I mean, it was a fabulous shoot, don't get me wrong. Three yeah. months in Buenos Aires in, in South America, one of my favourite cities. Um, and we spent two weeks on night shoots in the Docklands there that have been redressed to look like the city. We'd done uh, the quill makeups, or rather, I ended up not doing one. There were meant to be three assassins, and they cut my assassin before we started. Oh. Mark Cooley and Paul Jones had theirs, so I basically assisted them and just did things, you know, we did, you know, I just, just jotting around between them. And we had a great time. And Russell spent two weeks shooting stuff that when they then went to the editing room could not be cut together. <laughs> Russell's, Russell's a very creative person. I have a lot of respect for his visuals, but I think as a storyteller, I don't highly rate him personally mm. um and so they had to we had to spend another two weeks with second unit shooting all the bits that joined the bits that russell had shot oh. get... <laughs> and it still doesn't work that sequence yeah. is okay but you get to the end of the film and look at it subjectively they jump two thousand miles in a split second yeah because i know it's crazy the when they're they, going they, to the they, mountains to to look up from the shield it's like yeah. where are you where they are these mountains the they ran into yeah, they they, said, the, nobody, nobody will ever know. You, yeah, yeah. You've got a movie here where you've got an alien called McLeod at the beginning of a film. Yeah. Sure. If people don't care about that, why would they care about that at the end? Yeah. I mean, yeah. d just the fact that General Katana is watching the movie in a different planet in the yes. past that's yeah. taking place oh, in the God. future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, 
what what it's yeah. like crazy I mean, right it's at the start important. when they say on the planet zeist everybody's like wait what what yeah, what's yeah, happening yeah. this is not highlander did, did you watch yeah. that in the theater ryan yeah I, I watched it on tv and it's like so so here's the thing you just said mark coulier worked on the couple of assassins there with the quills uh, mark coulier and paul jones yeah so yeah, didn't mark coulier also work with on shuna sassy's makeup with the quills yeah, yeah. That's, so that's I guess he's got a thing with quills. We copied it from that. We, we, uh, it's, so it's exactly the same thing. Foam latex and pieces of plastic tubing, mm. but just sanded off at the end to make them look a little bit sharp and then airbrush. Yeah. yeah, exactly the same thing. Just oh my it, was, God. it was a great fun film to work on, but the sure. thing is, it was a fabulous place. I made a lot of friends there. I actually went back and did a commercial there about 10 years later mm -hmm. uh, for some friends of the producers who said, do you want to come back and do a, a yogurt commercial? And I made a family to look up like um, um, Frankenstein's family with oh. a Frankenstein monster in blue and then a Frankenstein's wife in pink with a, 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 a you know, the haircut with the, with the, the, the white bits and two uh -huh. kids who had bolts. Monsters. Oh, uh, nice. What was uh, the product? Uh, a yogurt. A yogurt, Glu okay. Glupis, Glupis yogurt. Yeah. yeah. So that production <laughs> must have had lots of problems because uh, like 1989, 1990 was when Argentina's economy was collapsing. Oh, yeah. So I guess that um, didn't help, right? Riots yes, in the yeah. street and stuff. Well, we had basically, the, the, we, we were worried at first, obviously after uh, it was 82, 83, the Falklands War, uh, oh, sorry, conflict, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> call it. Um, the thing is that, that there might be trouble about. There was nothing. Um, I actually, I was- You, so mean, the, you mean the Maldives con conflict? I was, oh, sorry, of course, yes, yes, that's Maldives. Yes. I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, I had, I, no, it doesn't, it's a lumber roll with some sheep. On sure, it, sure. Um, but the thing is, I had a fabulous assistant called uh, Jorge, or George, as I he said, you can call me George because it's Jorge to an English term is, is not as easy. Yeah. Um, and um, he he stopped short of buying me. I found, saw a fabulous poster on the street there of uh, an Argentinian soldier with his foot resting on a dead English soldier in a field full of sheep, saying "Las Malvinas es Argentinas." And I yes. so wanted it because I just like that kind of you know that inverse thing. Right. Um, but it was no, it was it was it was a brilliant time to be there. But as you say. Um, it was an amazing place because the architecture there is stunning. And yes, um, uh, Menem, wasn't it, who was going down at that point, mm -hmm. Carlos Menem. And the thing is that it just, the things were going mad. We were being paid um, into, direct into our bank accounts at home. Our per diems, our daily expenses were in dollars. And mm -hmm. if you had dollars, you were treated like a million. You could bypass queues to restaurants and clubs and everything. Right. Because the, the the inflation rate was it was so there were queues miles long at every garage on Monday night because all the yeah. prices tripled the next day. Wow! And it was the weirdest of weird times, but yeah. we, I suppose we were sheltered from it because we were just in our hotel, mostly night shooting, so we were sleeping during the day. But then again, Buenos Aires is one of those strange places that lives twenty four hours a day. They had you'd go out to a restaurant to eat after a day shoot, say at 11 or 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And there were kids just going to school because they were on the night shift because there were so many people in that city ah, wow. um, that they had two shifts of school and two shifts of teachers. Yeah. I mean, Buenos Aires uh, for a while was a major cultural, uh, you know, uh, uh, city. It was, yeah, yeah a lot of it's, philosophers it's, and thinkers it's were. Beautiful place, beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I said yes to going back there. We went back there for a week. And we shot a commercial and they said that we'll put you up in the hotel for a week if you want to spend a week here. And we spent two or three days extra just sort of like just going around the city. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place. I'd love to go back. And I have friends there who, mm. when this is all over, hopefully one yeah. day I will go back. Yeah. And so um, I didn't want to jump over or gloss over any any Highlander one, uh, Highlander, not one, but Highlander Um uh, you know, uh, amazing, the amazing parts of that movie that's just so well done. It, it stood the test of time forever. But then, you know, the second one seems like it's a lot more fun to talk for some reason. It's just, <laughs> just so wild. And then the, the way that the, uh, the set dressing and the, the, the was that a backlot? Because it looks like a backlot because the streets don't make a lot of sense. And then all of a sudden you have it's a train docks. going through. Yeah, it's the docks. Oh, it's, it's the docks. Okay. The train that goes through there is a real engine that they use to shunt. Oh. I mean, the, do the docks are long gone now. I have a print somewhere in the house, which I should, you know, if you look up an old map, it's uh -huh. the big docks because Buenos Aires was a major, major port right through sure. to the 30s, 40s, certainly okay. Victorian times. You know, they are Victorian times. But no, that we, we basically redressed 
um, with statues. But that's what made that elevated train under the train station car tracks and all that. The yeah. kind of weird New York City well, sort of. You know when you know when the guy gets his head chopped off, the, the assassin gets decapitated because he's lying on the tracks. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, the right, right, right. Right. that's that's that is a real train going over a dummy. <laughs> But it's a real train going over a dummy head with the actor with his head lying backwards into a pit. They dug a pit. Oh, out of wow. That's scary oh. with the real train. Man. And we, we replaced from about sort of like chest up and he's lying there. Yeah. Sort of going, oh, whatever. I'd probably not the actor. The, the, the two actors in the, 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 the assassins were stuntmen. Uh -huh. So I suppose considered it. It wasn't right. too hard for them yeah. to sit by so a huge <laughs> Sure. And literally, the train wheel literally went over the neck. And wow. Oh my God! Jeez. Yeah, I saw that last <laughs> night, and it's Jesus. those assassins were a little annoying with the ha, 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 and well, all that stuff. But you know, <laughs> they're skateboards. But they're flying skateboards and the wings and stuff. It, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's pretty lots, cool. Lots of fabulous wire work. Pete, um, um, the, the Pete, Pete, I think it's Pete. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Pete has um, as um. What's the condition where you swear? Um, where you swear? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Threats. Um, threats. Yep. Yeah. It has threats, which is um, not a lot of fun, should we say, when you're trying to stick a makeup right around his eyes, and he keeps doing that. The tech, uh... yeah. You, you get used to it, but they use that. Pete, uh, he's gone on. I think it's Pete. It's Pete Bukowski, and I think I can't remember the name of the guy. The other guy, the one who has threats. He's uh -huh. gone on to be an ambassador for people with threats, getting into films and, and oh. educating people and things like that. Okay. So they said they 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 said to him, said, look, you know, we love the fact that you got this, you know, that look makes you look slightly interesting. So they wanted that. But so it enhanced the performance. Up, yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not an easy makeup application. I, I yeah, definitely. Who made the who who worked on the uh, McLeod Christopher Lambert's uh, old age makeup? That was Greg Cannon. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that looks pretty. We good. weren't yeah. we weren't big enough. So the thing is, they wanted a, they wanted a name. Obviously, did they bring him uh, in sure. to do it? Sorry? Did they bring him into Spain to do it? Uh, no, it was shot in Argentina. Oh, and um, he great cannon all the way from America to Argentina. Yep. yep. And he, he was there for about two weeks. And so, they, uh -huh. they, I mean, the old age sequences aren't a great, there's not many, that many of them. And so they shot all Christoph's stuff in, in the old age makeup in about, in about four or five days. So he came over, did some prep, did a couple of tests, excuse me, and, um, and then um, did the application and left. I see. Yeah. Was was the quickening the movie where image animation kind of coalesced as an entity, or were you guys already like? Um, let's think. Highlander it, two, we talk about. No, yeah. Highlander two. Highlander two is just about where image animation just fell that apart. Was, that was like oh. 90, that was like ninety two. Oh, oh right, 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 right. Yeah, that's, that's when I left. Right. See, okay. So I, I was over in Argentina for two or three months. And things were happening back at home that made uh, a couple of us, myself, John Cormick and Simon Sace, a little bit edgy about the direction Bob was taking with the company. And so at that point, that's when we decided to leave. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I was getting phone calls from across the Atlantic just sort of saying, hang on a sec, I think Bob's going to do this or he's just going to run, he's going to stop doing that or whatever. And we weren't particularly happy. We mm -hmm. had no power because we didn't have any shares or anything. Sure, but we've sure. been there since the beginning for about the last six, seven, eight years, and um, it just all started to fall apart. Yeah, so you guys started Image Animation slightly, was it around the time of... 85. 85, okay. Is yeah, that like around the time of Life Force? Yeah, uh, just after. After that, yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's, I'd it's, really it's, tell no, about Highlander. Sorry, Highlander, sorry, yeah. it, Highlander, Highlander it, it, Animation started when Nick mm. left uh, Highlander, Bob gotcha. and I started image animation, image animation in a small workshop in Shepparton Studio. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I don't know why I mentioned like Highlander too. Yeah. So it's you were so a good a good year into uh, image animation when when you started on Hellraiser. Yeah, we'd been doing. We had a small workshop, and I was doing little models. And I vaguely recall we did a. Oh God, is the, the Gene Wilder film? Is it Haunted Holiday or something? Hmm. There's an old, awful Gene Wilder film which he did. <laughs> Gilda mm -hmm. Oh, the haunted honeymoon. That haunted one. honeymoon. Thank you. Gilda Radner. Um, yeah. And there's a bit where a, where a corpse comes up and he pulls the hand out of the grave and it sort of does that and it's severed and I I made that hand. Um, okay. You know, just so a little animatronic hand make we have left and so we just did that and we were just we were just sort of working for other bits and pieces and other films and trying to set up some of our own stuff and that's when um, a gentleman called um, Alan 
Alan Jones. Alan Jones, thank you. Yes, my my memory. Um, Alan Jones, who we'd known for years um, from his uh, working at the. Anyone that wrote Shadows of Eden? No. No, that's Stephen that's Jones. Stephen Jones. Yeah. 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 Alan Jones was, uh, you know, he's writing stuff for Fangoria. I think yeah. he did publicity for Highlander. There you go. Well, he does. He does publicity for loads of films now. He wrote, yeah. the, he wrote the blurb on the back of videos and DVDs, and he also helped yeah. run the guys at uh, Forbidden Planet Bookshop in London, mm-hmm. which oh. was just my second home in London because we knew all the guys there. We did window displays with some of the props and stuff from Hellraiser when it came out. Oh, cool! And so we, we know nice. the where anybody who liked fantasy and stuff, they went to Forbidden Planet because you could just sit and natter to, to like-minded people. It was a tiny little shop just in the in the West End in Soho. And um, so Alan knew Clive, and he sort of like phoned Bob and said, look, I've got this bloke here. And I, I hadn't heard him at that point. It was just, I think he'd just done the books of Blood and Damnation Game. And um, he said, I've got this guy who wants to meet you. So he brought him down to Shepparton, and um, we said hello. So you had already read the books of Blood and Damnation I, Game? No, I'd never even heard of him at that point. Ah. So the thing is, it's just, I mean, we, I read them, read a few. I've still got my old books of blood somewhere. Um, you know, and this, he, he brought him into the studio. And we, it, it was this sort of like, what would he have been there? He'd been about pushing 30, late 20s, pushing 30, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, because he's about, about seven or eight years older than me. Sure. Um, and the thing is, it's just sort of, a, it, it's this little bright, sparky young man that like, walks in, et cetera, et cetera. And says this and then proceeds to go over the basic story of Hellraiser with the ideas. Um, what, which was this at the Crouch End house where Clive was living at no, the time? Uh, no, no, it's uh, um, Shepperton, you said. We went to Crouch End. I think he, I think the first time we met him was in Shepperton. Okay, I think yeah. because the thing is, I've still got a picture somewhere of Clive holding a blowtorch, um, sort of going as a skull to say what he wanted for Frank or something. He was just oh. going, for the wow. <laughs> that would be amazing to see yeah um, that's so cool and it's just sort of it, it's just sort of you know he introduced himself and then sort of like so okay we get the script sorted and we got the job um we've done we've done a couple of other things we we had a, a larger workshop at that point it was the larger the two the, the workshops we had there we were on we tried to get onto a palace film I, for the name of life now, I cannot remember, which mm-hmm. had lots of fabulous makeup effects, which we've done some tests and bits and pieces for. And um, uh, stink. Yeah. We were there and Clive came in, and that's that was pretty much when he told us that. We we'd seen his place in Crouch End, and I did <laughs> we did a photo shoot there after Hellraiser for the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, but um with me and uh, a couple of other people blowing cigar smoke onto his face. <laughs> um, <laughs> for Rolling cup. Stone magazine? Yeah, shit, with a couple wow. of guys. There's cigars. something to hunt. Yeah, I wow. need to hunt that down. No, we, we were green at the end of it. Yeah. Um, and he basically <laughs> gave us the idea. And then we went we, we, smoke. <laughs> well, it's the thing is, it's, you know, you know, it's like with Clive, it's the thing is that he's he has, so I haven't seen him in 20 or 20 odd years, is that he has an infectious enthusiasm. And mm-hmm. being the young person he was, as he was then, is the thing is that he's, oh, yeah, yeah, this, there, yeah, this. And it was all very positive. And yeah, even from just the description of the script, we thought this could be really interesting because it's just some great characters and some blood and guts as well. So sure. that, that's where we took it from there and said, yeah, you know, let's do it. A okay. little more yeah. blood and guts than, than necessary. So if yeah. it got cut down, you still have some blood and guts. What kind of sketches or drawings did he show you at first? Um, he basically had some scribbles, but not a lot. Um, he, what he did have was um, a couple of books, and I still have a couple of books now, of a, a, a photographer called Joel Peter Whitkin, um, who's, I think... Yes, we're very familiar with his work. Yeah, his and I Christ, love his stuff. Piss Christ and all that. Oh, God, you know, I mean, just, I mean, he goes to Mexico and gets um, the corpses of dead babies and puts them into bowls of fruit for still life photos. Yeah. Uh. Um, his, work, his, his work is awesome. Chatterer is literally a Peter Whitkin photograph. He, there's a photograph of a man with... A rotted man, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's straight off Whitkin. There's is a guy what, is that, that what's a, behind you? No, no, that's just a painting. No, no, it's, it's, I mean, Pinhead was not based on it, but there was a gimp mask with nails in it, so to speak, mm. on one of the photos. So he said, this is my imagery. This is, I want stuff that's as horrendous and shocking as this. I want to be, sure. I want to go as far as we can, but I want it to be elegant and artistic. 
And, and he was to... and he was reading that Piercing Fans International Quarterly magazine, oh, PFIQ, everything, everything. and stuff like yeah, that. I'm yeah, it's all. I mean, Clive, you know, Clive, Clive liked to think he was a bit shocking, but I mean, you know, we'd seen it all by that point. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see any copies of that magazine or anything like that to take with you to to keep for reference? So, uh, though, um, possibly, I cannot remember. I just, I know we got some bits and pieces and, and stuff that, that we could use. And he just sort of said, make it artistic. He, he wants it to be, he wants it to be sexy. The whole thing, the Hellraiser was originally called Hellraiser, a love story. And he wanted them to be sexy. He wanted people to sort of like be jealous of the Cenobites. He wanted, like Frank did, to go that extra stage, you know, it's it work to, to be on the grave, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, and they are because the thing is, that's why the female centerbite has a very vaginal opening on her, on her, sure, neck, yeah, stuff, yeah. Cetera. deep throat, um, you know. And and why, when Clive sort of like had one drawing that was of a, of, of a man, look at Butterball's of, stomach, exactly, yeah, yeah. And, the way yeah. He, and the way he keeps playing with it as well, mm -hmm. um, all through the film. Um, but the thing is that with Pinhead, he had one drawing of a guy with spikes coming out of his face. There was another drawing that appeared sometime later, which I do not recall seeing at all, which I think he did afterwards, once I'd done the basic design. And the thing is that all I said was, look, I, I want to make it something sort of like more mundane, such as pins on or whatever. We, we, we went for nails. And the thing is, I want to make it more geometric. And that's what his was just roughly drawn on. I then did minus inch wide squares as much as I could mm. to fit onto the human face. Was this your drawing? That was my drawing, yeah. There you go. It's in uh, Doug Bradley's book. Yeah, and I have oh. no idea what the drawing is now. That was just a photo of Doug that I traced off and then did the drawing there. So, you know, that's, oh. that was the original design. Yeah, like Rick Baker used to do with a clear piece of acetate over yeah. a photograph of an actor. Yeah, totally, yeah. So I've, I've heard that uh, uh, there were other designs uh, that some people had thrown out into the mix, like John, little John Cormican had a design for Pinhead as well? Uh, possibly, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, he did a much more tribal type one. Mm -hmm. very more similar to Clive's but uh -huh. I mean pr pretty much from the get-go um, we we divided up the work between us so I was always going to do Pinhead John was always going to do the female Cenobite and Nigel Booth did Chatterer and Cliff Wallace did um, Butterball oh. who did um, the engineer? Uh, Paul Catling uh, sorry all Paul Catling and, and Little John yeah, okay. little John is in the picture, like pushing yes, the cart. So, uh, yeah. no, 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 little John's in the cart. Little John is the engineer. Uh huh. Okay, so the the bottom monster. He's, yeah. he's, pedaling, yeah. oh, yes, he's pedaling the wheels on the little. No, bike. not at all. No, no. There's there's two people behind pushing the cart. Basically, oh. he's sitting. If you think where the engineer's head is, that's little John's feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And then there's someone else standing, which moves that's the it. back legs. The arms are little John's arms. He's not moving it because he can't get a grip and he can't right. see because his head is in that big stinger that comes around yeah. the back end. Okay. Yeah. But his arms so are the just, ones that touch the walls. His big arms. Yeah. And it's meant to look like it is. But again, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're looking at an ultra low budget movie. This was a big effect for that. You know, the and, the and the engineer came afterwards uh, as kind of almost an afterthought when you guys got more money to make the Frank yes. Resurrection uh, yeah. scene. Right. That's yeah. when you guys they wanted a monster also to be in the movie. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sort of what it, it's it's it belied its low budget, should we say. It looks reasonably good. Oh yeah, um, for the budget and the the amount of yeah. time it's on screen. I mean, yeah. I made a model. We, you know, me and my friends, we made a model kit of it. <laughs> oh wow! You know, the engineer wall walker model kit. But, all, but I mean, you know, but you look at the look at that skeleton demon at the end. That was just a human skeleton with a goat skull and so yeah, skeleton, and it's you know, very and very some rubber cool. wings. You know, very it's effective, just... very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, does, I mean, let's talk about the Cenobites again, real quick. Like, okay, you did Pinhead. Who did the female again? Uh, little John, John Comican. And then who did Chatterer? Uh, Chatterer was Nigel Booth. Nigel Booth. Mm -hmm. Nigel's gone on to do various things. Uh, Nigel did uh, the burn makeup on Ralph Fiennes in... The English Patient? The English Patient, thank you. Oh, that's oh, a beautiful that's makeup. wonderful. Oh, it's, oh, he's it's a beautiful. stunning sculptor, and he's done lots more other things since. Yeah, he isn't Nigel, the... didn't he win an Academy Award or get nominated or something? You know, I think he got nominated. Yes. And I can't remember, but he's been working recently on a couple of things with Mark Coulier. So That's I think that the Mark, I mean, Mark Coulier. Didn't Mark yeah. Coulier get an Academy Award? Mark's got two. Yes. Wow. Yes. For, for Budapest and for um yes, he got what he got he got the two till the Swinton. No, he, he got Buda and the Thatcher makeup on the and the uh, the um, Iron Lady. 
he got he got Oscars oh. for both. Oh movies. yeah. <clears throat> It's old age, another old age, I think. Mm. So there's a couple of really funny pictures also on Doug's book. Uh, this is when, so you guys met, uh, you picked up Doug at the station the day he was going to get his uh, 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 life cast, and then you drove yeah. him over, over to Shepperton. And then he's he has uh, some experiences here about the cast and this amazing photo, which is yes. Doug Bradley wearing yeah. giant sunglasses. <laughs> with his, on the, on the list there, on, on that's uh, on the left hand side looking up strangely into the sky that's Nigel Booth yeah on the other side I think that looks like Will Petty it could be Will Petty I can't quite see that's me in the background uh. no the thing was is that when you're under sort of like all the allergenists and the plaster yeah it's way it's heavy, look, heavy. It's, heavy. Um, it's you'd be surprised how not heavy it is I've had it done and it's not killer heavy it's plaster bandage rather than plaster i just mean it um, makes your skin sag like if you if you have it's, if blood. you've got saggy skin it will sag a little <laughs> bit but then again, you know that's um, these days again it's silicon so it sags less that's but, on you buddy you got saggy skin <laughs> <laughs> but we always say is the thing well, is nowadays they do the computer animals. scans where you don't have to worry about that almost sure, yeah. almost almost they're getting there aren't they with the detail on the computer stuff yeah but um, we always said to the actor that so we'll take a picture of you in the life cast. But because they're covered in sort of like a, a centimetre thick of alginate and plaster, then the thing is that we always used to either draw on it or put silly things or just do daft things while we're around it. So when the Polaroid came out at the end, they got to go home with the silly Polaroid and we put the giant sunglasses on Doug, you know. So we've done, <laughs> yeah. I think Claire Higgins had a big Claire Higgins had a big smiley face on for when she had a life cast for Hellraiser. Oh jeez. <laughs> I've just recently looked on the internet and found some website uh, of stock photos got a bunch of like photos of uh, Ken Cranham and and Barbie Wilde having their makeup done and Ken yeah, is yeah. wearing that robe that striped yeah. robe and he's dancing right. around and you know yeah. it's and everybody's there you know so I've got, and, I've got the classic one that's just gone for uh, I don't think anybody's seen yet so I should find a picture of it so I can send you guys one sort of whatever but uh, uh, we have a thing here for um, charity called Red Nose Day Mm -hmm. which is um, basically oh, Doug with the pinhead movie. makeup with a red nose with a red nose on but <laughs> I've got I've got the picture that's before he's got he's, he's been in costume and it's lunchtime and he's basically I'm trying to think if he's just in a pair of shorts or he's got the skirt on he's he's, he's, he's on just top, so he's, he's pulling he's something red. in front of his waist and like oh yes yeah, and he's yeah, got yeah, red yeah. Butt stains and he's got the red nose on dancing and he's he had a few interesting days on her right too where he sort of lost it slightly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Philofax story where he was like, I had enough of this. I'm going to throw your Philofax yes, out the window yeah. if you don't uh, give me a, a, a fag break. <laughs> no, wasn't that because of a, some sort of medication problem or something? Oh, no, that's the. No, no, I just, we were sick and tired of yeah. getting up at three o'clock in the morning and, and doing the same old thing and working till 10 o'clock at night and getting two yeah. hours. Yeah. That's the embellished story that the nurse came in to give everybody <laughs> B12 shots and that that's oh, what triggered no. uh, Doug, but. It was really just he was burned out of like Lost sitting it. there with a hair dryer blowing in his face. And there was you know, no pandemic. I guess there was it wasn't even a pandemic and he went nuts. <laughs> well, it wasn't part of it also that he would get into makeup and then then they didn't need him for that day or something like that. That, oh, yeah. that, was, that was our story. I mean, basically, the thing is that um, <clears throat> we, we started off on Hellraiser. That was Hellraiser 2. We started off and I had Dave. It was Dave. I can't remember coming to do the Channard makeup. And there was a, a, a disagreement about because the, the person I was going to get in for it wanted to have an upfront credit Chenard makeup buy. And I said, look, A, I can't guarantee that. And B, it would be totally on phone or all the other. So he said, well, I'm not doing it. And this was about three or four weeks before the start of shooting. So I ended up, because Pinhead was already made, the pieces were simply duplications of the mold from the first film. I said, look, I'll do it. And Channard's the only makeup I've done as like a, an overhead mask. That's mm. the Pinhead pieces, yeah. So Pinhead, if you guys know, the thing is that foam latex shrinks very, very slightly. So when you do a foam well, latex, <laughs> so when you do a foam latex makeup, you have to do it in small pieces or pieces, because when you stick it on individually, you can then readjust it very slightly, maybe a millimeter, but it mm. shrinks. Like Dick if Smith with all the old age makeups, like exactly. That's but bit. if you do an overhead mask, if it shrinks, it can then not fit and pull the skin be very tight and not workable. Yeah, the nose so, hole is somewhere else. The eye hole is somewhere yeah, else. You exactly. Know? 
With silicon, you don't get that. That's why when they started doing those lovely big silicon makeups, they could be almost one big overhead piece. They've gone back to pieces on silicon because obviously if it's so thin, it might fall apart and break. Yeah, flat molds and things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. So with Channard, I didn't have any time. So I did him as a one overhead piece. The makeup runs basically what you see from around there and then down around his mouth. So I, I didn't want to have to worry about edges flapping off around here. So I kept it away from his mouth because that's the moving mm. part. And so everything else apart from his eyes is covered. Oh. His ears, of course, are slashed to hell by the wires. Yeah. And all I did was a one big piece, but I left, um, you rarely get to see the back of the makeup. I had um, somebody who was doing a copy of the Channard makeup and they wanted to know what the back looked like. And From I the Leviathan documentary, um, what's this, Stuart, I mean. Um, Gary Smart. Gary Smart. Yeah. Yes, that was it. Yes, Gary, of course it was Gary. It's like, guy. sorry, yes, it was Gary. <laughs> And um, sorry about that, Gary. And um, he'll be listening to this one day. And uh, it says it was Gary. Good for, good old Gary. And I said, so basically, the idea was that when you see in the film, we had those two very large penis tentacles come down with wires and stretch themselves across his face. Mm -hmm. So I had the idea that there'd be some kind of large soldering welding iron across the, in the back that would push them and weld them into the back of his head. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, is I just left an enormous great big patch right at the back of the head. So if, if there was shrinkage, I could push the whole thing forward and oh. then had a patching piece. So I stuck the wires on and then had a simple big gory patch at the back. I don't think you ever saw it in the movie, um, but it just meant that if it went round there, you'd see a big thing with all these wires being just going into this big gory mess on the back of his head. Wow. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I think Gary Smart's sculpture is probably the only one that's accurate that's out there because there's a couple of Chenard figures in a model yeah. kits and things, and they don't know what the back of it looked like. Exactly. Yeah. It's like it's, it's like Pinhead's some... feet. Yeah, yes, nobody knows what those look like. He doesn't have any legs. He has no <laughs> legs. <laughs> yeah. It just hovers. Yeah, yeah. that's what Doug well, says. Yeah, it'd be nice actually. Um, but on Hellraiser 2, because I'd then done, I'd said, look, okay, I'll do the Chenard makeup. And I said to him, right, I said to, uh, I think it was David Barron, who's the uh, line producer on the film, and said to him, so, do Pinard and Chenard ever appear in the same scene together? And he said, yes, there's one scene at the end. And he said, but we're shooting that, it's down for a Monday and a Thursday. So I said, okay, I can do that. So we approached the, the, the dreaded week, Monday, all pieces ready, etc. And they let me um, have a staggered start. So we're in at three o'clock in the morning. On the first morning, there's myself with Roy helping me do Doug. So three hours later, two and a half, we got it down to about two and a half, three hours with Doug. Roy who two, was helping? Uh, Roy, Roy Puddyfoot, my partner. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you're... Um, yeah. And he was, he was helping me. He'd, he'd been helping me stick the pin on from the very... So Roy, very who is helping you with Zoom at this moment. He was. Well, he's not now. I mean, yeah. That's why it's all gone wrong. <laughs> um, but um, no, so we stuck him in about two hours in. Roy would then finish off and take over because he'd seen me do it enough times. He could just sit there the paint and just bits and pieces and make that work and get dug in. So you costume. had pre-painted pieces already? Oh, yes. Yeah, they're all pre-painted. And we're, what kind of paint? Were you using pro no, just pack, 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 pack pack. paint, yeah. Okay. So they're all stuck on, blended, done. And Pinhead was an actually very easy makeup to do because the thing is that the joints are all on the scars. Oh, yeah. So okay. you can blend the There's the no blending edges apart. Just appear, just right. It so makes it much twist. easier. It makes it so easy. Yeah. Um, what I want to know is the so pins. Cool. Like you, I've understood that the metal pins in the first test makeup were yeah. kind of connected to little flat pieces. Explain about that. Okay, so originally Pinhead was nail head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I did was I bought some uh, small one inch copper nails, clipped the pointed end off of them, and then put them onto a brass plate. Now, now, how did you do that? With solder? Um, yeah, they, they were soldered on. Okay. But the point was, Clive, Clive didn't like those. He wanted pins. He kept saying, no, I want pins, I want pins. So we did it with pins. We're talking little sewing pins. Yeah. You know, millimeter wide, tiny little ends. So we did that, soldered them on. And of course, being so small, you could simply push them through the front make the makeup from the back. So you had a small oh. brass plate about five mil wide behind the foam. So the was, that, was that be like a farthing penny or something size? Oh, no, 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 about five, about five mil, about a quarter inch. Okay. About a quarter inch. So they did, Doug couldn't even fit it. Like a disc, a disc or a square that it was disc, soldered? A round, a round disc with sanded okay. edges. Okay. So uh, by the time it was on the phone, it moved, it did, didn't show. It just, it's, it's an old Tom Savini gag, isn't it? You know, you put your knife on top oh, of yeah, the plate. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. 
it was this it was fun and, so and fun. this was this metal plate was this like pushed up against the stone life cast so it would conform no 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 not at all no so oh. all you do is it's sculpted and then you do your pins and you get your piece of foam latex and you come from behind the piece of foam latex and the pin head is only about a millimeter or so wide it's tiny so you could push it through the foam without damaging the foam so what we got is almost individual yeah. pieces with their own pins in so every time you stuck it on, in many ways, again, the pins actually helped me because I could hold onto a pin and peel the edge back to put some glue down and then put the thing back down and use the pin to, to hold the piece. Like little handles. Yeah, exactly. And just so to be sure, uh, but the they were silver on. pins, right? Not silver gold, edge, yeah. because I think some parts of Hellbound, they must have used some sort of like coloring because some, sometimes it feels like they're yellow. But I no, guess no, it's just right, okay. So, no, that's, so that's where it all changed. You see, what happens was we did a test shoot. We were we made uh, a whole new set of, of well, we were down. At, no, this was the original set. This was the original. He was called Pinhead because they were pins. So the problem was is we did this test shoot and we they they already started to build um, sets. So we had them against a bit old, and you can find pictures of it online. There are two or three pictures which I should sort of search out. Um, but they were published in magazines because they got out of Doug with these tiny little thin pins that you can hardly see. And Robin Vigeon came in, they shot it, photographed it, and they said, we can't see the pins. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd said this all along. I'd said, I think they're going to be too fine because when I photographed the test sculpt, it didn't show. Mm. So Clive said, hmm, they don't show, do they? So I thought, great, two weeks to start a shooting. What the hell are we going to do? So it actually worked out. All I did was I took a pair of pliers and I literally clipped off the very tiny end of the pin, the, the big, you know, the top, the top T part of the pin, mm -hmm. clipped it off. So what you had was, was a, a, a straight, tiny, thin piece of metal with a brass plate on that you could simply push through the foam. I then went out and bought a load of thin brass tubing, hollow tubing. Oh. Oh, I snipped okay. the ends off lots of brass nails and super glued mm -hmm. them to the tube. So all you would do was to make the pieces was to push the piece through the foam and then put the hollow nail on top of the pin. Right. Uh, At the end of the day, removal, you, you just slide dome. those tubes off. Yeah. yeah day, just so the, the light would bounce off them and make it more visible because they were thicker. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, they were thicker. They were three times thicker. But yeah. at the end of the day, you simply pull the brass bits off, pop them into a jar. I'd made two or three sets, so there was always a set ready for the next day's shoot. So that was it. That was that was the that was basically the story. But there are pictures around, I mean, with the pins. And whilst it looked to the eyes slightly more elegant, it didn't show on film. It just didn't show at all. So sure. now the, the appliances, the foam pieces, have all the pins in them with the little blast brass pieces glued on yeah. from the back. And those are just sitting there like on a life cast or something ready. To yeah, there were six the pieces. Well, yeah, it was made in six picture, pieces. Uh, the picture that Josiah had on, on there is the thing is yeah. you saw that. The thing is that, it's that, that, that imagine the nails and that they would sit there on a day and then we just stick them on. Right. So we'd yeah. start with the face, using, start with the face piece. And... Were you using Prozade? Uh, yes. Those are the days when we had to, still had a, a magical product called Dow Corning 355. I still have a bottle of it. Yeah. <laughs> I have a Uber. I yeah, have a Uber. Elixir, the Elixir wow. they, they, they've, they've all, I, I know some people have still got some of it, et cetera, et cetera, and they just hold on to one of those days. But I mean, there are obviously th those silica duties now. There, there are ones that are just as good. Remember um, the but, glass brown bottles? It, it came yeah. from Berman's. My bottle came yeah. from Berman's. But the thing is, the problem with it is because it's it's got such a highly astringent chemical base, Prosade was infinitely easier. Um, but at the end of a shooting day, Doug had sweated enough to be able to bring the whole thing off anyway. So the, the Prosade wasn't a problem. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and, and Waxworks was between Hellraiser 1 and 2. Did you work at Waxworks as well? Uh, yes, I did. Um, okay. I did okay. an alien. Yeah, I'm, I'm I curious about. Else. Mm -hmm. I was doing ah. something else at the time, another sure. project, and okay. so they, they, it was it was a. Um, um, I, had, I had a couple of weeks where I had nothing to do, and I said, "Well, can I do a wax work then?" So I did. Uh, there is a brief shot of, a, of an alien that's basically got three mouths and six eyes uh -huh. with a big brain, like the uh, alien yeah, yeah. the mutant from this island uh -huh. Earth. Yeah, this uh, island I Earth. Did, I did him. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm <laughs> curious. One of those tricks where you used a batch of foam that hadn't been baked and you sculpted it kind of with a heat gun and shit and things like that? No, no. no. <laughs> oh, that, that was Nightbreed. Oh. Sure, that, that was, was right, all hands on deck and let's yeah. let's crack this up. I'm curious about, because I've, I've read that, you know, uh, 
some of the stuff that image animation did was also music videos. And I found something that said Bob Keen had worked on something like uh, uh, Wild Boys and Duran, uh, Duran, yeah, yeah Duran Duran. Duran. Animatronic so, head and shoulders thing. Yeah, I love that music video where they got Simon Lebon just on the on the windmill yeah. going in the we water, and there's a little weird creature coming up with a sharp that, teeth. Dave, Dave White and Steve Norrington built that creature. Wow. Um, um, they, they, they knew the producers, and they said, well, can we build the creature? And they said, yeah, if you want to. And so they got that. We, yeah. had, we went in and did the Wild Boys in two weeks of killer long day shoots. Oh, wow. Uh, I got about an hour of sleep every night. And did um, they film okay he direct those? Yes, he did. Yes, very good. Wow. But we don't talk, we don't talk about the. So that's Highlander. That's the Highlander connection. No, no, we don't talk about the animatronic head. You, 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 you said about the animatronic wild boy head. Yes, yes. Do you, do you not know that you guys don't know the story? No. Uh, okay, that animatronic head is the Patrick Stewart animatronic head from where in life. Oh, oh the mechanism. Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So the thing is, all we, we stuck. Well, we stuck a um, um, a set of um, 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 wild boy prosthetics onto it. Oh, and so okay. if you look closely, you can see it's him, but it's not that much. So <laughs> they say, look, they'll never recognise it. It's not a problem. It does and look odd. It does look a no, strange. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, a few years later, um, Nick actually mentioned it to somebody. And it came out, and Patrick Stewart threatened to sue them. And I think, are you kidding me? Oh, oh, man. It's a it's a likeness on screen. Wow, wow. That's, a stretch. So, that's, that's a real stretch. So, <laughs> what was that Patrick had used for? I didn't catch that. It broke up. Uh, right. So, Patrick Stewart is in life force, and in life okay, force, gotcha. um, his body, his dead body, is lying on a in a helicopter, mm -hmm. and blood starts to come out <laughs> to coagulate into Matilda May in the back of the helicopter. Mm -hmm. That means and William has... Shatner can sue for Halloween. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, but so, no, the thing is, um, so the thing is, we had an animatronic Patrick Stewart head that basically was tipped up at an angle so the blood would drop out of his head that way. So when you looked at it the right way up, it looked like the blood was flowing into the air to form Matilda May. Yeah. And that was, what, that was what that head was built for. And it was sitting in the workshop. And they said, have you got anything we can put on the bar and sort of interesting props and things? So Nick said, we got this, we could dress it to look like a wild boy head. And he did. Wow. That's funny. It's like with uh, Patrick Stewart, we just listened to a, an mm. episode of another podcast where Steve Railsback was the guest and he talked about he had oh. to do a full kiss with Patrick Stewart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and there was also some work in Arena, the music video, right? Well, that was that was but no, basically Arena was, was just Bob. Wild Boys. Uh, yeah, Arena yeah. was basically a, a, a combination of Duran Duran videos, mm -hmm. um, sort of thrown in. But Wild Boys was the main thing at the end, so to speak. And that was gotcha. a massive thing. It was two, it was two weeks, enormous yeah. set, 20, 30 dancers every day with full body paint, spray paint and prosthetics. Yeah. Uh, Dave White and his creature in the pool, Simon Von being almost drowned on that windmill, and, and a twenty foot high gas jet. Crazy! It was, it, was, it was fabulous. Yeah, you know, it was exhausting, but it was an amazing thing. Yeah, it's just so much fun watching that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a really um, good thing as well. So. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, and then Hellbound, you had like a crew of like what, maybe 10, 15 people there. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I'd say I'd say about ten or fifteen, and mm. that's when um, oh, uh, basically. Uh, yeah, because Mark Cooley, uh, I'm trying to trying to think who did what here. I think Mark Cooley then went on to do the female Cenobite, which is Barbie Wilde. Mm -hmm. And that was Mark Cooley had come on when we were doing waxwork. And he's such a brilliant bloke, obviously a brilliant bloke. He's now won two Oscars, etc. But the thing is, it's just sort of fun. Um, he came on during waxwork and then we took him on during Hellbound as well. I don't know, Nightbreed. Well, um, so he came on for that. And uh, John did, of oh, course, John did Skin Julia. That right. was, yeah. was its major well, little john you mean little john yes yeah, yeah. was That's... there some overlap between the 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 end of the shooting for for hellraiser 2 and the beginning of the shooting for nightbreed did did it cross well, over no, at no, all no, or nightbreed was much like nightbreed was after hellraiser 2 oh, sorry hellraiser 2 you said i'm very sorry yeah yeah uh, no what was that we knew about nightbreed at the shooting of end of hellraiser 2 and oh, pretty okay. much um, um, post. So let's think. Hellraiser 2 was 88. 88. 88. And then Nightbreed 89. So 89, 90. So the thing is that we actually, yes, yeah. So we, we pretty much run into it because Nightbreed was nearly a, about eight or nine month pre production period. Oh, okay. And then Nightbreed was just a crazy, you know, uh, Guinness record, most monsters on a movie, <laughs> most makeups, I, I, all that no, stuff. I, 
who knows? I mean, the thing is that on that, you, you, you don't know what we sort of went through. For, for, for eight months, we just tried everything. We, we actually rolled a naked woman covered in glue in small polystyrene packing balls and spray painted her. And then the <laughs> back to see if it would work. We tried everything. To look like skin tags or something, right? Oh, no, 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 no. We're talking she was covered head to foot. And oh. we then put them little on the background. Nodules, little round balls all over her. She sprayed her, sort of sprayed her so she merged into the background, so she then came out. It was like she was made of blobs. Wow. It was still in the film. <laughs> but we did trying all kinds stuff. of crazy things. That's great. But we, we did whole, I did a whole body. Um, Chris uh, Fitzgerald sculpted a head for it, but I actually did a whole body of a guy. I think you see him briefly slithering on the floor. He's got like a large slug body. Oh, yeah. I've seen a to... picture of the foam skull. You know, you're just. That's it, yeah. it was just pieces of foam. 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 It's, foam. It's, it's glue and latex just sort of strung over it with a hairdryer and then painted. A character slithering on the floor. Is that the guy who's um, is he's got a shaved head and he's just this weird monster with a tentacle yeah. connecting him to something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's 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 blink and you'll miss it stuff. We know that Clive said this is going to be lots. of This stuff won't get seen. You saw it in the book. I'm glad they did the book. You uh, there were there was that lovely tour through Midian that, that Boone gets you know to see all the creatures. Yeah. So specifics like like Vasty Moses, which little John yeah. did you know, the, yeah. with the broken legs, etc. All that right. kind of. It's just you know. Um, there were specifics, yes, that got in there. And then, of course, we got the extra money afterwards as well to do the extra stuff, which... You, you did Baphomet, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it was Bernard Henry, right? So he, I, I've yeah. seen a picture of you sculpting Bernard Henry's uh, makeup, and you're actually wearing a shovel yeah. <laughs> just for the photo, yeah, just, just to ham it up. Photo. Yeah, it's just for the photo. Of yeah, course. and and we've already featured once the video where you explained uh, you had a, a picture, a drawing that Clive did on the floor of yeah. what he had dreamt about Baphomet being. Um, so we were just having problems getting to it. We could, we we wanted something godlike, that something that would strike awe. And I I had ideas. I at one point I had four acrobats. Um, sort of like forming a face out of their bodies with full. Oh, weird. Oh, yeah, it's you know, oh, wow. like, weird. You know, we've done loads and loads of stuff, but we just cried to say, oh, I don't know. Yeah. And he came in that morning and said, I've got it. I dreamt it. So he gave me that, of uh, which that painting is now not with me. Um, <laughs> and the thing is that um, I then took it from there and sculpted it. And he gave me one shot. Basically, I mean, how I, important I, that was to the whole film, you know, the god. Of minions, well, it's, you know. it's, it sure. had to look, it had to, I mean, there's obviously the crucifixion pose. There's the light inside, which took myself and Steve Painter about four weeks mm -hmm. to sort of do on the, there's a full size one, you know, we're talking a massive yeah, big a giant one, one, right? And then mm -hmm. a normal man wearing a makeup. Yeah, he's, he's about, he's about, he's about nearly 12 feet high. You know, he's was, about wow. twice, twice. Was that done with fiber optics at all or? Yeah, fiber optic. It was. It was basically. Um, I went out to. A, a, I found the shop in um, Acton in London that did fiber optic curtains, mm -hmm. and it's proper glass fiber optic. So it's glass threads encased in translucent plastic, and they did door curtains that were as about eight feet wide from a light box that was huge that you could put a color wheel into. So I bought three of those for about ten thousand pounds or something, and made my own color wheel sort of based on tests. And then the fiber optics are hot glued into around the edge. And then there are about 10 bulbs in there on various rear stats and bits and pieces with myself and Steve going, oh, like just making it. Practical, <laughs> effects. Practical effects. I love yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. But, but of course, sadly, completely covered over by a rather blotchy optical in the final film. Yeah. Which I wasn't I happy with. So. Yeah. Too bad the un unoptical footage doesn't exist i've seen i've seen the optical footage and i think it, it, it does nice. exist yeah it does it, exist it's, it's sparkled i wanted the edge to sparkle and we did the same thing on the makeup version as well on bernard, on bernard. it was just fabulous and so that really that black skin it. was it sparkly no the black no um, no the the edge the, the sparkles were at the edge where the skin broke so it's like gotcha. the light oh, inside okay. um, yeah. how'd you do that on the makeup how'd you do that on the actor well, no, uh, no, it's just stuck into the makeup. It's literally, it's, it's, um, it's more like, um, you remember Max Headroom? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, the thing is, Max Headroom was a fiberglass body piece. This was foam latex, but it wouldn't move, but he only had to go down to just above his chest. I see. So I could put the sparkles in. He didn't have hands to move or anything, so he, he could move, uh, you know, just moving his shoulders around. Right. So that worked. But the makeup, um, Bernard was a very, very handsome man. I wanted Baphomet to be just beautiful. I wanted him to be adored and admired by anybody. How did they find him? 
Well, I, I cast him. Oh. <laughs> um, I basically just sort of said, OK, let's uh, I put out a casting call. Um, I wanted a certain type of face and uh, black guys seem to fit the best options for the certain type of sort of like the, the nose, the, sh the, sh the, the shape. Did of the have to sign so up? On that. So, but well, basically, I got these guys. And I had about, I think there was about, there was about seven or eight black guys, and about sort of like five or six other guys, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I got in, and we took photos, and I did drawings over them. Uh, and Bernard was just this incredibly beautiful man with the most beautiful eyes you have ever seen. Uh, um, and so I said, right, it's him. As they said, yeah, cast him. He's just, he's just a model. He's just a male model, so we don't need to pay him that much. So you, you have who you want. And so what you see in the film is, is his brow. Um, is, is not his and the cheeks but the rest of the face is Bernard under the make uh, just under colour with those eyes so it's got this beautiful face and those beautiful eyes and then the rest of it so we just distended his brain slightly and if you look at ever get the chance to see the back of his head he's covered in male and female genitalia type shaped growth really? oh. oh okay I um, wanted him to be totally male female mm. anything you know anything just shapes it's, yeah. it's just all stuff that's in the background little bits and pieces and i have so to look at it on a blu-ray to see if i can notice all that stuff because when i saw it the I, first time it was on you know crappy vhs you couldn't tell yeah clive promised me one shot where he said we'll see the back and there is one shot which is the back of the full-size statue head where the camera pans up and over to look down at boone standing in uh -huh. front of him and yeah. you can uh -huh. just about see it just the whole sculpt in the back and the the spine and all that stuff is just so exquisite, so beautiful. It, it really it is. Just, you want to put? I mean, that was my one job. I, I, I was running a workshop with fifty people in for, for a year, so I, I couldn't do that many makeups. We were going on odd days and just do silly makeups just to populate the background. But Baphomet, who just shot for about I think one day, basically. Oh. Very what, was uh, was so, Bernard so, Henry's voice in? Did it make it into the movie, or was that no, someone I don't else? Think so. No, no, oh, okay. that's probably dubbed in. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that design and that character is so important. I mean, you got to do God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, the paint, and the paint job story, of course, the things you asked about, because he's, he's, he's a very dark black sort of color. So when you look at him on the thing and what was happening was, is that next door in the workshop, they were building Tim Burton's Batmobile for the first Batman film. And I copied, yeah, yeah, Giger. I, copied their paint, I copied their paint job. Literally next door to our workshop was the original, I think probably the best, you know, one with the fabulous bat fins on the end, the, the yeah. Michael Keaton one. The whole bat, the whole Gotham City set was just around the corner. We used to go and walk down Gotham City High Street every day. Um, and I popped in there and looked at it and looked at the car and said, it's, it sort of shimmers. And they said, yeah, it's, it's, inter it's called interference colours. And I said, can you show me? And they said, yeah, it's painted black. And then you basically spray paint what are called interference colours. They're like very micro fine metallic paints. Mm -hmm. So and I did that way the right. same. It's, it's, and it's he's, basically, he's black and you paint over, there's a pink and a blue and a gold interference paint lightly sprayed over the top. So when the light kicks off him, you've got these little colour rainbows just sort of kicking off him. It's basically yeah. transparent paint, but it's got that metallic dust. It's, it. it's micro fine dust, so you can't. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. metallic. Oh. It, it, yeah, it becomes iridescent. Yeah. If you spray it on a person, you'd almost say it's not there until the light just kicks off and it refracts and reflects the light differently into little rainbows of color. Sure, wow. sure. that's great. That, that's, that's awesome. Neat. That's awesome. That movie is just such an iconic movie. I was just so happy when, you know, the whole movement to get the director's cut and, you know, the cabal cut and whatever. Yeah. Um, it, it's just great. Now there's so much more to see. And, you know, yeah. people are just they I think if people could have a four hour cut of that movie with all the monsters <laughs> and they would probably have it, yeah. you oh, know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the, 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 the final cut now is, is so, so, so much better. I mean, the, yeah. the, what was so what there were there were there were problems um about two thirds of the way through the production the actual shooting the producer lost control mm -hmm. um you 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 have um a, a triangle when you're working you have a director you have the producer there he is and there's us and the thing is the director says to us or to us there the director says to us i'd love to do this we then go to the producer and say clive wants this it'll cost this the producer then says to us you can't afford that so we go to Clive and says that the producer says we can't. There was a missing link between the producer and the director, oh. and they just the producer lost control of the finances. Yeah. So Morgan Creek brought in a woman called Gabriella Martinelli, who is famous and rightly so. She's she's fabulous. She's interesting, but 
yeah, yeah, yeah. shit out of you, basically. And she came in with another producer, etc., and just took rain, took charge of it. They signed, they fact sacked the original producer, Chris Big, who was on Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. Um, they, he, he was t- he was let let go, shall we say? Jeez. And uh, we finished the film under her under a much tighter rein. Now she then said, and of course this is where you get that famous basically quote from from James Robinson, the head of Morgan Creek, who said to Clive, "But Clive, they're going to like the monsters." Yeah, yeah, that's the point. If you're not, yeah, if you're not careful, they're gonna, they're not, they're going to like yeah. the monsters. Yeah, that's and the so point. They, it's like they, you did they, not read the script. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You're meant to this. It's meant. To, they're just meant to be a microcosm of society. That was always the idea. You know that. I know that. And yeah. it's the psychiatrists and the police and the people who want power, etc. They're the baddies. Yeah, they're the authoritarians. So that's yeah. why they then brought in this other stuff. They want. They they felt they couldn't sell the movie. And if you look at, um, there is that classic poster of the sort of scared female eyes that says, Laurie didn't know what she was getting into when she met Boone. She was yeah. going to She thought she knew her boyfriend. She was wrong. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's just, it's just, it just, they didn't understand it. So they wanted this extra stuff. They wanted some more silly characters. Well, let's say silly. Mark Cuneo did that gorgeous um, little demon character. Paul Jones did the guy with the, the one-eyed snakes coming out of his belly. Yeah, Leroy yeah. yeah. Gone. That kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And soon as soon as who, who did the the makeup that was? Uh, I think his name was Saul in the book, but it was just the guy with the one eye, one green eye in the middle of his face. Cool. His... That, now that's that's just one of those makeups that yeah. just got done. The yeah, crew yeah. basically <laughs> spent six months just saying, "Oh, I'll sculpt this. Oh, I'll sculpt that." Somebody said, "Oh, I'll sculpt a hand that I can stick onto somebody's chin." Oh, yeah. I'll sculpt this. <laughs> it just it was literally just that. It was it was people throwing stuff in so we could populate the background. Wow. Yeah, and, and so many, just, yeah, and so many people who went on to become greats in the industry. Yeah, yeah. but Amazing. also I, I felt that the whole reshoot stuff actually sort of marred the movie because of actually bringing out the Cronenberg character with all the psycho stuff and the severed head on the bar and all that. Yeah, I thought it lost a lot by adding yeah. that to it. And it, that's it, what we got thrown at us when it first got released was was something trying to be a psycho slasher movie. Yeah, yeah, it Losing shifted the focus life. of the movie. Totally. Yeah, distracted yeah, from totally. And also, was... if you look at Cronenberg, it was shot three months later, some of it in the States, and he's got a completely different haircut. Oh. If you look at Cronenberg throughout the movie, his hair changes. A little bit, yeah, 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 a little oh, bit. Wow. It becomes a little more yeah. a little more full on the top, yeah. yeah. And yeah, you get that old, uh, who was the actor who played, who gets his head chopped off? He's an old horror film actor, isn't he? From yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, from the, yeah. the, uh, um, the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, Na- yeah. No, no, Narcisse. Um, oh. No, Are you no, talking no, about Narcisse? No. Uh, the guy who gets his head chopped off and puts onto the bar by David Cronenberg. Oh, yeah, yeah, John Agar. Who? Are you talking about John Agar? That's yeah. it, John Agar, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, so they, the they bring in the somebody to get the horror fans in, and to me, they just, they got the wrong end of the stick. I mean, yeah. Jim Robinson's the guy who didn't get exorcist. He didn't, you know, Jim Robinson's the guy who said to, what was it, um, uh, Blatty sort of said, how can you have an exorcist film without having an exorcism? And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we did that film too, remember three. you guys? We did yeah. the uh, oh, yeah. we three. we made a commentary track for that and we brought that up as well. Yeah. Uh you know, just the uh the, the performance the wonderful films ever made until yeah. you get to Beautiful. the end. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It just and then everything goes bananas at the yeah. end. It's yeah. crazy. In the yeah. real movie, it's just you know, the guy shows up uh and just shoots him in his cell, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. You know, because you know it's 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 that and it's beautiful. And, it's and that's a great voice. moment of release. It's much yeah. better than that gaudy like exorcism yeah. and the floor falls off and hell yeah. comes up and I'm it's like, what's yeah. going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, horrible. yeah. Horrible. yeah. <laughs> Actually, I like the ending. With I the, do too. With the I mean, sure, I it, can, it can be fun. I mean, Highlander 2 is fun. I'm not gonna mm. say it's not fun, but it's doesn't fun. make any sense. It's like, oh my god, yeah. it's it's one of those movies be- that lost completely the thread you know yeah uh, yeah it doesn't fit with the rest of the movie the rest of the movie is dark and quiet and when he's describing yeah. what he's doing to those people yeah and the very thought that they've been given a drug that allows them to know what's going on but not do anything about it and it, it's just it's hard and brad, brad Dourif was never better yeah, you know, yeah, he was yeah. so good. and george yeah. Scott was absolutely brilliant oh yeah i love the, the, the biggest jump in film history with the nurse with the shears yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It goes on forever. It goes on forever. Oh, and you think, oh, it's going to be now. Cool. She's going into the bedroom, and then she yeah. comes out, and then she goes yeah. back to the thing, and yeah. then she goes back, and then she goes there, and it's like, Arr! and then the statue right. with no head, you know. And then he comes like that's it, yeah. And it's yeah. Kind of weird is that they watch the movies with two different heads. Like in other words, <laughs> as an effects guy, I like effects even if the movie isn't that great, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. As a film fan, 
you know, I love a good story. I love good performances. I love sure. you know, like not just horror or any, I mean, all films like Citizen Kane or, you know, anything, you know, I, I just, I do appreciate even a bad film has good effects sometimes. Yeah. Can, I, can I put it this way? Is the thing is that I, when I watch a film, I wish to be transported to an alternate reality, whether that reality is just a mundane Monday morning washing or whatever, or it's a big sort of like spaceship rocking or whatever. The thing is that sort of like as long as, I mean, okay, the story doesn't necessarily sort of like work sometimes, but as long as the effects work, I don't watch movies and watch the effects. So if yeah. I believe nowadays with CGI and all that kind of thing, when I could see a spaceship flying through space and it looks like a spaceship flying through space, I don't sit there and go, oh, what a fabulous effect. I'll watch it again or I'll read about it, possibly in cine effects back in the day and the various magazines and things like that. But I don't. So I, I read, I wrote for cine effects. Yeah. <laughs> So, I know that was one of the greatest losses of COVID to my mind. Is the thing is, it was a stunning magazine. I just so in, and oh. it, it's sad that it became slightly more CG oriented. They, I agree. They that's that's when I physical. stopped. That's when I yeah. stopped. My last involvement was back in the day when it was all practical. I wrote. But then most before. things are CGI these days, aren't they? You know. Yes. So. I've I've um, you know recently movies, certain blockbuster movies at least, they become more like a, a ride, like an experience, right? I. To yeah, use something that you said in a previous then, interview, I think some sometimes the film grammar is lost. Um, yeah. And 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 that it's you're not yeah. looking at a, a, a you know a frame, yeah. and then the that's shot, and just, then the scene. Just you're just looking you know, at something that's just, you know, look at this. Look at how much stuff we can slap that's on here, and, yeah, and look at how much stuff we put in the background. And look, he's flying. It's Captain so America is, you know, destroying a, the squid monster. You know, that's, I mean, spectacle, spectacle. You, know, you, you, yeah. go, you go back to me, the best transformation scene is still American Werewolf. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Because the thing is, because film grammar is the idea, is the thing is that you're cutting backwards and forwards. And you never, when you're watching that, you never for one minute think about the strict budget limitations they had on that picture. And no, so the thing no. is that you have to it's cut backwards clever, and forwards. It's just cleverly done. That's it's awesome. beautiful. Yeah. And yet the thing is that these days they want to see it. I mean, and I worked, I worked on a production of uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for uh, American Michael Caine. With Michael Caine. Yeah. And the director wanted to see a transformation in one complete go. And for the money they had, I was up front and honest. I, I've, I've been up front and honest with the bet. I've been up front and honest with Ken Russell saying you can't afford that. I've been up front and honest with him. You can't afford that, et cetera, et cetera. And they hate to hear to that. that they hate Sorry? to hear that. <laughs> they hate it when you do that. So the thing is, I'm, I'm just saying that we can do this. So we can try that. And I said, look, the thing is here, we don't have this kind of money. So the thing is that we came up with the best possible thing that we thought we could do. And we ripped off again. Well, we, we do. We pass. I, I think the one thing you guys know is makeup artists, we pass things around. We're Absolutely. not saying, oh, I can't tell you I did that. Mm -hmm. So no, we no. Dick, Smith, the, um, Dick Smith helped everybody to get over it. Exactly. Yeah. And so, but we took a Dick Smith idea that he used the... I can't remember the name of the film. There's a guy in a hospital Spasms. bed. Spasms. Spasms. Spasms, thank you very much. And the trichloroethane, methane, whatever it is, that when you put it into foam latex, when you put it, the, the remover into foam, it swells. When you put this stuff in, it goes and does that. Oh. And he used it in spasms on, on the guy in the bed and pre-painted cracks. And when you pump it in from behind, the whole face just becomes this massive blob. It erupts. Oh. It erupts. Do, do you oh, remember... Uh, do you remember that Jack the Ripper miniseries with uh, Michael Caine was, and Armand Asante? That, that was the same director. Yeah. So that scene where there's a scene where I think it's Armand Asante is play, doing a play on stage. And then there's a yes. scene where he gets over emotional and he he has he this evil the, moment. The, and even his face. Yeah. yeah. That was that always stayed in my mind. Like, so that, well, how did they was, do that? that? I've no idea. That wasn't me. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> just that's an amazing like. Now, all we did know. with for David is the thing is that other oh, director, I can't remember second name, but the thing is that we said, look, okay, so we'll we we sculpted, we took a live cast of Michael Caine, mm -hmm. we then uh, in a uh, screaming position with his eyes and closed. What kind of material did you use? Just plain old mm -hmm. alginate? Oh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. That's all we had back in the day. That's silicone all back then. Yeah, no. <laughs> And so we did the nice cast. We reset John. We did a, a, a clay pull out of a, 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 a Chavant pull out of it, so it's a, a meltable clay. Resculpted that gorgeous. so it looked gorgeous. Made it into a foam latex skin puppet that you could put your hand in, and then sealed it all off and put tubes in it, so we could pump trichloroethane, methane, whatever it was, into it, and it would start to swell. 
Yeah. So and who got the honor ones? of putting their hand up in there? I <laughs> guess, guess who? You. <laughs> <laughs> it smells, and I was covered in three lines of polythene, but some still got through. It's not killer, killer stuff, but it's not nice. But I'm under yeah. a, a table, basically. And um, the thing is that we then said, look, okay, if we make it so he starts <laughs> thrashing doing that and uh -huh. thrashing around, you on could the cut. Of the cut, we could cut. So we then cut to, so we have Michael Caine doing that and thrashing. Uh -huh. And then we cut to our puppet, and then it had it blobbed up. Then more thrashing, we cut to a, uh, a sculpted version of the, that one, reasonably similar, with and the then with, with bladders. And then we cut to another one, which has got bladders that are going down, and then cut back to Michael, uh, a version of the makeup. With the monster uh, makeup. Of of makeup the, of that, so we could blend them together. And I said, this is the best I can come up with for what we've got. That's brilliant, because it's like going backward. You, you start with the yeah. finish and go backward, and then you start with the, the start and go toward the middle. You know, and yeah, you, you it, bridge it in work. the middle. Yeah, that's awesome. Work. But it didn't work. It's yeah. just, we had some lovely shots. And we had black, we had everything, and it all looked nice. And said, but it wouldn't cut together. And he was so insistent because he wanted everything so locked off. Well, he wanted all one place. continuous shot, which that's yes. stupid. Yeah. But, but in the end, no, yeah. they didn't get that. They, they no. didn't put that in. So, it was, it was well, the, so basically, the thing is, I was I was summarily fired from the film, so mm. to speak. Or he said, okay. Uh, Bob said, Bob said it's probably best if you if you leave this production now. I'll take over. And he took, all the yeah, he took all the prosthetics and bits and pieces, and they took some shots and stuck bladders on Michael, et cetera, et cetera, um, and then did what you see there, which was exactly what I wanted to do in the first place. I had quoted book Cutaways. Cut, cut I had quoted forward, American yeah. Will and said, look at American Will. This is the best way of doing it, for your, A, for your budget, and B, it's the best way. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they got. It's not wonderful what's there, but it works. The but part that gets good. me in, in uh, American Werewolf is the part where the hand is transforming and the fingers extend. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, but yeah, 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 amazing obviously. stuff. Uh -huh. But yeah. David, the director actually went to ILM and said, if you were going to do this and said, you've got all these um, elements, these physical elements, he said, what would you charge to put it all together and to, to do it? And they said, oh, at least two million. Now we got 50 grand. <laughs> For the entire oh, picture, yeah. makeups, blood, guts, everything. And if they and were to classic. take, in other words, if they were to take your footage that you guys had, all the physical effects, all the makeup yeah. effects, and then take it to ILM, and then they put. Well, they they said they stuff. said they charged two million if they had to do the physical effects as well. Mm -hmm. and then oh, 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 just starting from they scratch. Said, they said they it. said you, they said what you got was good, but you'd never be able to put that together, so to speak. But it's it's just ah. we tried our best, and I kept saying I don't think this will work. I don't, and I was sadly proved right but yeah i think one of the biggest examples of when cgi goes all over physical effects and and destroys a movie was the thing from 2011 oh yeah, yeah. they're ADI, yeah. They're beautiful that, yeah they had creatures. so so much good stuff that you, they have a youtube channel you can yeah. see all the physical stuff they had and then they just smeared like cgi all over that stuff yeah. and just Oh, it was such a shame. It's, anyway, it's also as well as the thing is, I find the CGI, it's the environment in the CGI. The fact is, you can now go anywhere. Yeah. And the thing is that I, I, I first noticed it on the uh, the first remake of the Planet of the Apes films, where yeah. the camera never stops moving. You don't get a chance to breathe. Yeah, it's not it's natural. Yeah. It's not well, in our general, it's, we, we blinked. Those were the cuts. Yeah. And you got to see something from three percent. You got this power, whereas when you're flying around, you felt like you were flying, and it didn't feel real. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. future generations will grow up getting used to that, and and who knows, perhaps accept it more. But right. they got used to. They're getting better at it. They've pulled back from that whole that sort of God's eye view. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking about that too. If if uh, current generations maybe have have gotten so saturated with this kind of stuff that. Maybe they don't have the patience to watch a werewolf transformation. That's right, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Well, not the old fashioned way, yeah, where you're just yeah. sitting in the chair and it just. They won't watch black and white movies. Yeah. You know, so it's just. Yeah. It's just that, that you, you talk about most people today, and certainly even, even horror <laughs> fans sometimes, they'll never have watched either Hammer or American International pictures, things like that, from the, you know, or, or even they'll probably know Karloff and Lugosi, things like yeah. that. But they won't be that they won't have known those things with the red paint for blood, etc. And, and sure, yeah. or, or, or the thing. layer of the white worm, you know, that yeah, I just yeah, saw yeah. the other day. I had a I, I saw it on VHS. You know, I'm not ashamed to say it. I got it on VHS. Film. Fabulous film. Yeah. Uh, Hugh Grant. I mean, just starting <laughs> up. <laughs> and, and, tell us about that. Tell us about that, Jeff. 
Where are the white ones? Um, it was, I, I didn't have, I wasn't there a lot. That's the weird thing. I was in Los Angeles um, doing something else with Bob mm -hmm. and we started it off and uh, Neil Gorton was sculpting the worm, designing and sculpted the worm and I'm trying to think who else. The, the worm that who. that's that goes around the, the yeah, person that's... I mean, yeah. he basically, the basic design. Neil sculpted the full size. There, there are three different size heads. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that the, there's a small size one, which is a hand puppet. So it's about about a foot long. Which is like down in the size. tube in the tunnel kind of. That's it, yeah. Tunnel. So there's, yeah, well, yeah. there's, when, when like... there's a hole into the ground, there's the thing is that you've got it coming up. So we used to, we, they built as a false perspective set and then dangled Amanda Donmaho over it or whoever was dangling at the time. Mm -hmm. And so when you see it in the distance, it's the small hand puppet. Then there's a three foot high head, which somebody can get in and go like that to make it go open and close. And then there's a seven foot high head, which is just the head and it's seven foot and actually has two people inside moving backwards to make it open and close. And that's when Neil Gordon that sculpted? That's, he sculpted them all. Oh, wow. Oh, well, yeah, I think so. Or perhaps Kate sculpted the small head, I can't, but he designed it. And that was when the, you see a, a stunt woman that actually sort of dropped down into it because it was soft foam with, with soft foam teeth and everything. She drops onto this big cushion, basically, this seven foot high cushion. But it was, <laughs> it was, it was weird because the thing is that Ken, Ken Russell was one of my heroes growing up. You know, The Devils is one of my favorite movies. All of his movies sure. are yeah. fabulous and over the top and just amazing. Bobby, yeah. yeah. And, and Oliver Reed thing. is in that one. Oliver yeah. Reed was also in The Gladiator. Um, and yeah. Tommy. They yeah. Love Tommy. But I got to meet Ken, you know, I had a couple of meetings with him. Um, I, 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 I incurred his anger at one point where I said the same line as I said to um, David on Jeff and Hyde. I said, I'm sorry, but you can't afford that. Mm. Yeah. He came up with this fantastical idea, which, you know, again, you're, we you're have the truth teller. Color. You're the guy that they don't want to hear. You know? yeah. Yeah. But luckily, they didn't want to hear even less. I think it was the costume designer um, came out with the most stupid remark I think I've ever heard. And I cannot remember what it was, but it's so stupid. He turned on her. And in a second, he'd forgotten about me and was just shouting at her in the middle of the office. <laughs> and the next day, it was the next day it was you walk onto the set and he said, "Oh, Jeff, Jeff, have a glass of champagne," you know, at ten o'clock in the morning, things like that. He was yeah. as large as as large as as, as life had portrayed wow. him. But at least ILM said him right, man. You know, two million dollars yeah. you know, just to to do the same thing that you attempted to do for fifty grand. Sure, sure. Yeah. We, yeah. we did it all the time. I was talking to somebody the other day, actually, on a uh, thing about on a production site or whatever on Facebook or something, and just talking about producers in general. And we did a um, um, Palace Pictures. We did Dust Devil. Do you remember Dust Devil? Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Palace Pictures. And basically, the thing is, there's various effects. There's the bull's head. There's the makeup on the guy. There's the zombie head. There's the fingers. My, all all, all yeah. of my fingers are in that box, etc. And um, the thing is that um, they came to us and said, look, can you give us a quote on these effects? Which is the usual way you do it. So we, we costed up all the effects and said, it could be this. And they said, we haven't quite got that. So I said, why don't you tell us how much you've got? <laughs> then, but then I can give you lots more because the thing is that they said, no. If we'll we tell you what we can do for what you have. Yeah. yeah. But they said, no, if we take this effect out, then how much would that cost? So we go away. Now, of course, if you've got a phone maker in for a week, that phone maker is still there for a week, even if you take one effect out, because he's still making phones all week. Right. So the price doesn't go down that much. Yeah, they don't understand so, the way to budget a phone. Yeah. Like if they so let so you go. figure it yeah. out for them, you yeah. get so much more bang for their buck. Exactly. Yeah. So I said that. And eventually, after about six or seven goes, they said, look, okay, we've got about 50 grand. Again, 50 grand is a very prominent figure in low budget films those days, obviously. Yeah. But the thing is that when they finally said that, I said, right, now we can talk. And we gave them pretty much what they wanted. Mm. You know, so it's, it's just, it's just, it's infuriating. They just, they like to be in control, I suppose. That's the yeah. 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 And they like to yeah. fill their own pockets with the champagne yeah. and all that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And this week I discovered Dr. Terror's Vault of Horror on YouTube. Yeah. Someone put a few episodes up there. Yeah, um, yeah it's a great, great uh, horror host yeah. show. It was yeah. Did you have fun doing that? Yes, a lot. And, and you, made, you made the lead, you know, like horror host character guy? Yes. He was basically, it was um, essentially, when was this? This would have been uh, early 90s. I'd left Image. Yeah, 93, uh, 94. Dust Devil and did with, we set up a company called Dream Machine, myself, John, and Simon, and that fell okay. apart for about a year and a half. Uh, 
partially because um, certain people were doing things wrong and partially because their accountant was siphoning funds into his own bank account. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> but there you go. And um, so that fell apart. And I potted around. I did a few things. I did some TV shows and things like that. And uh, they came to me sort of uh, from the guys from the BBC, Nick, Nick Friend Jones and a couple of the guys, a couple of the names now. Um, and they said, look, we're doing this all night um, Halloween horror festival. We're going to show about seven or eight films. And we're doing lots of talking heads pieces between the films. And would you like to be a talking head? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. So yeah. it gets to about a month or so from the actual when they're going to sort of shoot it. And they said, look, we're really, really sorry. No insult to you. We'd love to have you on. But we've got John Carpenter. We've got this, et cetera. You'd be, we love to, but we haven't got the time to fit you in. Oh, man. So they said, OK. So I said, OK, no problem. No, I'm not, not that egotistical about it, that kind of thing. And they just sort of said, but we've got a few grand spare in the budget. And we'd love to have this host. Would you do us something for that? And I said, well, I'm not doing anything. So rather than turn down two or three grand's worth of work, you know, that I could sit in my garage and do or whatever, I said, yeah, of course. And they said, well, do you want to sort of do something fun? Do you have a laugh? So I basically took a picture of Jack Nicholson as the Joker smiling. And I traced off the top of that and did the big ear and did this big oh, sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. And I pinched a Steve Wang paint job from Predator. <laughs> With all the little hole, the little black spots and stuff, yeah, um, forehead, etc., and they loved it. And so I said, "Great!" And they got with this fabulous actor called Guy, um, uh -huh. Guy Henry. Well, Guy Henry. He's reasonably well known in this country because he's in a couple of TV shows in this country, and of course, mm. recently played the Grand Moff Tarkin in the the newest Star Wars films. Oh, so, okay, uh, I didn't know that. That's got, that's got um, the second of the new three. When you see Moff Tarkin. Gotcha. That's a guy with the CGI Peter Cushing on his face. Oh, I see. That's, that's and guys makeup works. too, right? They did a makeup that, also. They did, but it didn't work. Mm. Um, so it's it's pure CGI, but it is guy's voice. They said, huh. just try, don't do an impression, but just we'll live with your voice because it's very close. And he's a sure. lovely bloke. And so we did this full overhead seven piece makeup, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We went down to a place called Kent Church Hall in Wales, which is an old house, and shot over two nights there. I think it was with him doing all these intros and put him in a suit and had him sitting there. And he loved it. And he was one of those, <laughs> like all actors, when you put full foam latex on them, they sit there rock solid. And I say, you can move, it's soft. So it's designed to allow you to act. And once he discovered he could smile, uh -huh. he went for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw a trailer of it with him riding around on these carnival well, rides. That's it. So the Very charismatic goes, character. <laughs> Yeah, we get the whole night. Is. They then bring him back for three whole series. We did a series um, in a theatre, which we shot in the West End. So they did Friday night horror movie double bills, which he introduced. So we did a whole series about ten shows based in from a theatre in the West End. We then did uh, a couple of nights shooting at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, which uh, is what you saw there. Yeah, with him introducing films. And the last one was a fabulous series. We went actually into the BBC studios, and we did spoofs of things like the National Lottery, which we recalled the National Slaughtery. Ah, um, classic. Tim, Tim, Newman, Tim Newman was in there. We had people there. We even had him done up like, a, there's a, a woman, uh, a late pop singer called Scylla Black in this country who did a show called Surprise, Surprise. Uh -huh. um, and we had we dragged Dr. Terror up out of in a miniskirt with a blonde wig and a Liverpoolian accent and introduced <laughs> him. Them. And he ran for three series and we got a lot of work out of it. And he was it was the best fun ever because that's when makeups are really fun. You get to do a good makeup because I enjoyed doing that. Yeah, and um, it was it was quite an intricate makeup, but it was, it was good fun to do. Yeah, well, yeah Jeff, it's Jeff. Yeah. Even though they didn't have you on camera doing your bit, you know, your little talking bit, I am a Jeff Portas fan. Boy. <laughs> yeah. I am your biggest fan, man. <laughs> yeah, and then you had uh, a few other projects, and then you did Children of Dune, the miniseries, which is very yeah. well considered by a lot of Dune fans, and. Uh, uh, you know the Dune series of fans. It's better than the first series. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, first and, series, the first series didn't have the budget, so it looks like you're watching. It looks like you keep jump cutting from a computer game yeah. in the seventies. Oh. Um, and the sets that they had dioramas. We had blue screens and green sure. screens. Yeah, they had yeah. projected dioramas that didn't work as well. And the CGI got a lot better. And we had Susan Sarandon. So like, yeah, Susan so Sarandon was pretty as well. So I think yeah. that. And Did, and. Um, Oh, the name of the lead actor who played um, Paul, um, not Paul, um, the young actor who's the leader. Is Atreides. it uh, Paul Atreides? No, no, yeah. uh, I think it's uh, Leto. The Scottish actor. 
Well, the, Alec no, Newman? Tito is his father. No, 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 Alec Newman is his father, the Scottish actor. Oh, okay. Oh, I can't uh, remember. Let's that see. Edward Roy Adderton? Oh, no, that's Duncan Idaho. <sighs> Muadib is played by Alec Newman. Yeah, he's, he's, he was he was he's been in the last two Shyamalan, you know, the two Shyamalan, the three Shyamalan films were that which are joined, mm -hmm. and he was the he was the big muscular guy in the last one. He's got the multiple personalities. James McAvoy. Oh, oh. James McAvoy. Yeah, there yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's really young in that one. As well, when okay. He was sort of like M. M. Shyamalan. Uh, M. Shyamalan. <laughs> yeah, the Glass <laughs> movie and, and, and that stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That was a that was a fabulous production because that was a shot in Prague, which is a fabulous place. They would flies out there for a week to shoot, cut a few scenes and flies back and flies back later. The makeup was dead easy to stick on. It was a bit of a tortuous route to get to it. John, John designed it as a as a very um, um, symmetrical thing, and the producers didn't like the symmetry, so we ended up cutting up the entire makeup into small pieces into I think it's 173 small pieces. Wow. Wow. Yeah. When he was fully, almost fully transformed, and individually had a plan. We had boards and boards of these pieces. So you had number one, number five, number ten, etc. Right. And you did different stages of transformation. Yeah, for people who don't know, Leto the second is uh, he turns himself. He uh, uh, so the worms come from sand trout in Arrakis, yeah. and sand trout are these little creatures and he starts placing them on his skin and covering his body and then eventually he will become a giant worm a transformed yeah. worm emperor so that's 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 so what he's going to become oh, that's crazy steps. well we started we, we we colored them to look like sort of butterfly scales was the idea but we wanted him to be transforming from the inside symmetrically from the center of his chest ah. but they just didn't like it so we we ended up saying okay let's make it some kind of disease we started on his little finger on one hand and stage one, say, was three pieces just there. Stage two was five more pieces, ten, up to the, the one day they said, yeah. right, stick everything so, you've got. Yeah, the, the side, the neck. Point, so they, you know, they never yeah. really had a, a pre-production storyboards or a maquette or anything no, to find no, it, the design? It was changing all the way through the production. But the, wow. the, director, was a, the director was a really nice bloke. And, the, you know, the producers weren't too bad on it either. It was, it was a fun shoot. And plus the fact they were so good, they didn't want to pay us. Um, for getting up at three o'clock in the morning, sick of makeup on. So they would let us start at seven or eight o'clock in the morning, a normal starting time, and just make sure our characters only shot in the afternoon till about seven or eight o'clock in the evening. So it was wow. very nice. How, how oh. unusual that they would actually be considerate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's fabulous. You know, you wow. actually felt like a human being for a change. So. Do you remember the Guild Navigator makeup in that show? Uh, that was CGI, wasn't it, in the second one? Was it? I think yeah. so, yeah. I it, thought it might have had some sort of I like physical. No. I, I'm not a fan of it personally. Right. I mean, when you, sorry, when you go back to the, the David Lynch, I love the David Lynch film. Oh uh, yeah, with the big, the big uh, head and the weird like. Yeah. But I yeah. love the fact that the Guild Navigator was just too impish and too CGI and too mermaid. -y. It just looked yeah, cute, right? yeah. yeah it has the, the web film that was a big rubber yeah. animatronic creature. Yeah, it, was, it just didn't have the gravitas of the, the one in the Lynch film. Yeah. I mean, that was next a month we're Baldy creature. Yeah. yeah, next next month we're going to get the new Dune adaptation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Are you excited about that? Are you yes, interested in watching sorry. that? It, it looks yeah. pretty good. I saw oh, the yeah, trailer. Yeah. I think, you see, it's, it's been quite fascinating between the first trailer and the second trailer. The first trailer said yes. And I've never read the books. Um, and the thing is that I know people do say that the Lynch one is reasonably close. Mm. And of course, there is that fabled four hour cut that David Lynch says he will never ever go back to because he had such a horrendous experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would love to. I, I remember the first time I saw Dune was on a VHS, mm -hmm. and we actually got up the next morning. We both loved it so much, we watched it again before we took the tape back to the rental shop. Oh, wow. I, 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 I got it in the theater on the first. I've got, I've, got a, I've got an HD DVD of it now, which I, I just, it's a wonderful. It just uh, yeah, yeah. Fun. I have it on Blu ray right there. Me too. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty amazing. The documentary the new... on the Alexander Jodorowsky's version. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I've, got, I've, got the book, I've got the book of the designs. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, was, that was that was pretty impressive. It's something you could do a lot with, and the new one looks like he's been reasonably faithful to the book because it's sort of mm. there are so many bits that you then say, "Well, oh, that's similar to that film." Yeah. yeah. The, act, the actors look very good, and I think the leads look very, very good indeed. Um, so it'll be. I, it's. I, I always love Sean Phillips as the Reverend Mother because I thought she was up those gorgeous bald heads that you yeah. cannot put an edge on. Yeah. Um, she was just perfect for it. She was so good at it. 
Um, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how I react to the characters. But I quite like the differences between the two trailers, the way that the producers have obviously said, look, we've given the Dune fans their serious trailer. Let's get the action fans in. And you think, wow, this looks incredible. And yeah. you can have both. And they stick a few puns the in there. Of, yeah. yeah, but if this is a two and a half hour movie, that's the first half of the book or what the original film was. It is the first half, yeah. Oh, oh really? You know, because it's yeah. just... You just sort of, it's like the two Blade Runner pictures together. You can watch them both together hmm. and they work. So if they do this with the Dune, I would have to sit there for five hours. I sure. go, do, you, do you remember the days when we used to go to the cinema and I used the to double bill every time? Oh, more than that. Well, every time Star Wars. Theaters, film I would stay in the films all day long. I would go yeah. to the first well, screening. Star, I, I saw yeah. Star Wars. <laughs> It was a Star Wars Empire double bill. Then it was a Star Wars Empire Jedi triple bill. Then it was mm -hmm. a Star Wars Empire, then whatever that first thing was, Quadra. And it ended up being six films in a day. And you'd sit and there. I used to see all the Planet of the Apes films in a row yeah, in a movie, yeah. you know, like at the, wow. at the conventions and stuff. I used to, I used to go to All Nighters. We used to have a fabulous cinema in London called The Scala. It was uh -huh. a club cinema that you paid about 20 quid membership a year for. And it was a uh -huh. repertory cinema. So it showed um, double bills most nights of anything from old movies to new movies to yeah. things, all this kind of stuff. And every Saturday night, they had all-nighters. And they would have like horror all-nighters. They had gay all-nighters. They had 3D all-nighters, things like that. And it was famous because for two, th apart from the all-nighters, you'd end up there at 10 o'clock in the night and you'd walk out dizzy at 7 o'clock in the morning. Get us some coming up, yeah. <laughs> But the best bit was I had a cat in the cinema that used to have free reign of the cinema. And you would occasionally hear screams from people who suddenly had the cat jump onto yeah. their shoulders. <laughs> and they used to show the old Hammer films and things like that. And it That's was just, true it was cat brilliant. scare. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the most favorite uh, screenings, double bills I saw was in in Portugal. We had a big festival called Fantas Porto, which is a fa fantastic film festival. And they kept inviting Doug over and he would show up. And, you know, I saw Nightbreed, the, the European premiere there. I saw like the Hellraiser 4 European premiere there. And it was pretty, pretty fun. But we had one of those. It starts at like midnight or, or one in the morning. I don't remember. So I had to drive there with my brother. It was like 20 miles away. So we drove over to it. It was in this old auditorium, old theater um, in, in Porto. Um, and it was a double bill Hellraiser, Hellraiser 2. Mm -hmm. And Doug was there doing an intro. I'm assuming he just went back to his hotel after that because, you know, I want to go to sleep. But it was amazing. We went there. We watched it. We came out of the theater like four something in the morning. We're like, hey, there's a flea market that opens like at five in the morning. Let's go check that out. Let's go grab some food and, you know, go. And it was the, the best stuff to do. It's like, yeah. 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 No, it's, I, I don't, it's, it's unfor unfortunately the thing is that the whole thing, the cinema circuit has become so commercialized. They don't really yeah. do those. Anymore. The only place I know that still does those um, or did before COVID and hopefully will be afterwards is a cinema called the Prince Charles. Mm -hmm. in Leicester Square in Southern Yeah, yeah. They've done some um, Hellraiser screenings there with uh, exactly special guests. They're like Scala Wars. They're a repertory cinema. So they show a film for one night, then it goes back. Or yeah. Double Bills, that you know, it's, it's Citizen Kane and the Third Man, that kind of stuff. And they do do all-nighters as well. They'll do a Rocky Horror Double Bill and things like that, you know, and then people yeah. get interested for that. And it's just they'll do all the stuff. And now things are so different because of COVID and the movie theaters yeah. and the movies come out both in streaming and the theater. And there's yeah, all yeah. sorts of problems because yeah. of that. When they did the Black Widow movie, two years before they actually shot the movie, they already had the previs made for the action scenes. They were already doing the CGI stuff for yeah. the action scenes that we see in the movie two years before photography began. Yeah. And it's like, it, it's just a ride now, you know, it's like. But I, I think it is. Yeah. I think. Let me, let me say this, you guys, I'm going to depend on you guys to give me good descriptions of the new Dune movie and all these sure, things. Yeah, sure. yeah. I'm yeah. blind now, and I did see, you know, the TV series one that you worked on, you know, the Sci-Fi Channel yeah, broadcasted yeah. it, and I saw that, you know, when I still had sight. So I saw the David Lynch, I saw that one, I've heard all the audio books, you know, and I'm waiting for your guys to tell me if it's this new one is going to be good. But sure, we will do. Yeah, it's, it looks it looks like it's going to be fabulous. And and going by visitors and Blade Runner twenty forty nine, yeah. so I, I love his I love his style. I like yeah. big long slow movies yeah. as long as they have a heart and they're going somewhere. Even if they don't get there and they sort of say, "Oh, we can't finish that," you know. But yeah. I, I thought twenty forty nine was fabulous. I was in tears at the end of it. it I loved beautiful. it. Yeah, I loved Same. it too. Um, and it seems like people just hard barely talked about it when it came yeah. out. Yeah, too long, I, I suppose. Yeah, some people are just not wired to to um, 
they think, where's the action? Where's the stuff going on? I need to have yeah. like, you know, yeah, where, where is it? Let's move it on. Fast and the Furious. Yeah. Well, yeah. Then, you know. Oh yeah, Fast and the Furious, <laughs> which is a perfect example <laughs> okay. of that, where the camera yeah. just flows into the car right. and around the guy and comes out into the yeah. other car and yeah. then comes out again. It's but like, you, what? But you can do something. Some of my favorite stuff in some of the Zemeckis picture, What Lies Beneath, mm. where he has his famous impossible shots. Oh. You know when he's got Michelle Pfeiffer in the bath? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah. Harrison Ford, you know Harrison Ford's trying to kill her, right. and he's got he's got uh, Zemeckis is well known for you, you know in Contact when he does that fabulous shot up the stairs where mm -hmm. it becomes the bathroom cabinet door as Jodie Foster's character opens all the young Jodie Foster, and it's an mm -hmm. impossible shot. He goes through windows all the time huh. in a lot of yeah. his films. There's a window yeah. there, yeah, with a flying camera. Yeah. That oh no, but you look you look at uh, what lies beneath, which I quite enjoyed as a scary film. But there's three shots in the, which are physically impossible where he places um, from this side of the bathtub, he places Michelle Pfeiffer's limp, drugged body into a bath and he's going to mm -hmm. drown her. And the camera flies over the top and goes through the wall and then he's looking up at her through the water, through a bath wall and a, and a bath. Wow, I, I don't remember that. But that's 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 yeah, that's I don't that's remember so that either. There's a shot with Ryan uh, when when she knocks um, Harrison Ford out and he's lying on the floor. The camera goes down to him and it goes underneath his head. You're looking through the floor at him. And when she drives away wow. in the truck just before he dies, the camera flies through the bridge. Watch it. There's a bridge with girders and they go boom, boom, boom. The camera goes through. It goes through the bridge, goes through the glass, goes through the wow. dashboard. It ends up literally the camera between her legs looking up at her face. Isn't that the 90s? Wasn't that back in the 90s? Yes, yeah. And so back then, I guess that was novel, you know, like to be able to well, have crazy no, no. videos. As far as it, What Lies Beneath was was in a, a, a slow period for him between movies, and he did it as a sort of a little vanity sort of project or whatever. Something it's, I, I like to it. It's some really stuff technique, there. maybe. Mm. That's interesting. But I mean, you know, even back in the day, like a film like Citizen Kane did yeah. have some crazy cool. angles and pullbacks and yep. matte paintings and miniatures yep. and hanging. And miniatures that grow and, apart. And, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Fabulous film. I mean, you know, there's some shots that were done in camera, uh, went back before CGI. One of them is like the uh, the flight of the navigator uh, when the ship is coming out of the hangar. There's a shot known as a shift and shot where they use a mirror. And then a reflect another mirror in front of the the thing yeah. that they're shooting, and then and then the other mirror is reflecting onto that to obstruct something. Like in this case, it was a pillar yeah. that was pushing the, the 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 thing out. And that's a it's done in camera. And at the end of the day, boom, you've done your shot in camera. Well, it's, you're good it's, to go. It's like the land speeder in them stars. Exactly. I was yeah. just gonna say that because it's got yeah. like a mylar yeah. skirt around the tires, and it's rolling around on the desert, and it's reflecting the desert. Yeah, up. yeah. yeah. Of course, back, later. Go back to um. Go back to uh, I was talking about some of the day and showing them some footage from um, things like in old Chicago and San Francisco. From the fire and the earthquake in those scenes, those are stunning oh, amazing. stuff. Yeah, amazing. Somebody Miniatures. brought up um, well, there was a shot I saw, which I went back and looked at, which is the miniatures they use for Samson and Delilah, the Victor Mature film, oh, when wow. he pushes the temple down. Is that massive statue? And you can see people running around. It, it's a it's a twenty foot high miniature. It's a bigger wow. miniature. A bigger the original. Yeah, and there are there are people this sort of about eight inches high, not models, but they then actually mat into it. They develop this special matting technique. The guy won an Oscar for hmm. to actually put moving people into this thing getting crushed. And it's impossible. Wow. It's amazing. Yo, you know, I, I remember hearing you on another podcast where you were talking about matte paintings and Albert Whitlock and stuff. Yeah, and I, yeah. got, I got to meet Albert Whitlock and see some of those matte paintings in person from the uh, Towering Inferno and from uh, Earthquake and oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, we, I had a convention where we got to bring mm -hmm. some of his matte paintings. They were painted on masonite, some of them, not on yeah, all on yeah. glass. And he used actual black and white photographs pasted onto the masonite and then yeah. painted on top of the black and white photographs yeah. for some of those buildings like an earthquake all the crushed buildings and yeah. the aftermath and some of the stuff like uh, Al abraham lincoln in logan's run like that was some of that was photographs yeah. they had ivy and stuff painted on top of it you know for the he was brilliant I, I, I went to a lecture by him at the national film theater and so they, they he, he stood there and talked about it but actually then showed um, showed the shot before the map painting, showed the shot with the map taken out, showed the painting, and then showed the two joined together. Yeah, and, and then, then like a hollow spot tricks. where he would insert a live yeah. action, you know. But also the little tricks that he would use to create movement. 
right. uh, within the painting. So the thing is like reflections on the water. There's a lovely, there's a lovely one with um, a castle and he used, a, he, he basically scraped small holes in the paint on the glass and then did a moiré pattern with a light behind it. So he would flicker two oh, fingers for, the glass. for lightning? Little bits of movement in the crowd that stopped it looking like a static painting. Oh, That's yeah. Brilliant. And yeah, as he said, like, as he like, the, like the pennants on a castle with wind yeah. flicker or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But as he described this, the thing is that when you saw those paintings close, you thought, they're so rough. I know, they were I mean, muddy. Like I saw yeah. them in person and yeah. black and white photo, you could see it. You could see the yeah. edge of the of the paper. You know, it's so said, crude. But it's, it's, but it's, it's the way you look. Yeah. Film, in those days, it was film and it softened them. So the thing is that they actually joined together. They graded them together. Yeah. These days with CGI, the, the, the CGI, the, the, the nice digital map paintings that look incredible. And of course they're in 3D, so you can move around them and things, which is even better. Right. But it's, it's yeah, they're all right. <laughs> I like the, the art, it seems to have been lost somewhat, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So these days you've uh, transitioned into teaching, is that right? Uh, I stopped teaching about three years, three or four years ago. Oh, okay. And okay. I sort of virtually retired. But you oh, did yeah. many years of teaching. Uh, I did about 25 years teaching at uh, wow. the profession, doing, uh, doing prosthetics there. Yeah, so you transitioned around the mid two thousands and more into that. It was uh, it the it was it, it was earlier than that. I, yeah. I was I was teaching back in the mid nineties. Mid nineties okay. was sort of sparse. So it, there was there was Doctor Terror. Sure. And I did um, the, a TV series called Scratchy and Co, which you mentioned before, or we call it and Co rather than Company, which yeah. was a Saturday morning kids show um, based again directly on. Do you remember Max Headroom? Uh -huh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah I grew based up on, on that. Max Headroom, but with a complete foam latex top half body suit and oh. rubber hair. And yeah, I did yeah. props and I made a talking football and a talking penguin. And we ran for, <laughs> we ran for three years um, doing that, which was great fun, just shooting every every couple of weeks in London, yeah. um, shooting intros for cartoons and stuff like the Banana Splits used to do. Oh, and so wow. I did, and then I, just, I did uh, prosthetics. Like the for, young ones. Like the young ones. Yeah, yeah. But I did this, I did uh, prosthetics for, I made, but didn't apply the prosthetics from Uncle Alice McGowan, who's a, a, an impressionist. Mm -hmm. Who does impressions of people and had to? I did, I did about three or four series for him doing all his prosthetics for him and the, the woman who was doing the females for him. Kind of like um, splitting just, image or something like that. Like, so not so much caricature. He, um, he's, he has a certain type of face and he wanted to look a little bit more like David Beckham or whoever he was impersonating ah, at the time. So I did mainly noses, the occasional cheeks, the occasional chin, but mainly noses. Because it wasn't a big budget thing, and I would sit at home and, and get to surround myself with loads of pictures of David Beckham, sure. and then try and sculpt those that looked similar, then yeah. mould it, and then create gelatin pieces that I popped in the post, and then I sent them to my artist to stick them on for the shoe. Right. So there was lots. There was various things going on in the nineties and into the two thousands, and then she said the children of Dune popped up after we were doing some stuff, um, and then just sort of like you know I, I sort of faded out of actually the working side of it simply because. Um, people like Mark Coulier and other people, younger people, were getting going. And of course, Neil Gordon sort of like took over the entire world, sort of doing Doctor Who and all the BBC stuff, mm. and set up the Millennium Effects, a mega company, um, mm. and you know had the facilities to do bigger, better stuff. So we would get more of the work anyway. But it didn't bother me, you know. I, sort of, I was almost down to it by then. And the teaching went on for about twenty, I think it was about twenty years. I finished and, about. And was it all years. at the London College of Fashion? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and how was, does the was, how does that work translate into the the, the courses there? What sort of were they, uh, they do a, a, a London College of Fashion covers a wide remit. So the thing is, they had one course there called um, 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 costume makeup and three okay. three um, D effects for sure. performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we would do stage stuff. Um, it was the courses now because of government cutbacks and now COVID oh. has drastically been cut back. But the cutbacks. Yeah. I left because the thing is, when I first started, I was still living in London. I then moved to Norfolk in 2000, and I would get a train back and stop over at Little John's or friends' houses. And they were paying me, uh, I was doing three, four days a week, four or five, six hour days, and paying and earning a very nice wage out of it. By the end of it, they were getting me there about two separate days a week for about three hours a day. And the thing became, um, it became a degree course about halfway through while I was there. And when you become a degree course, you have to write everything down. And it became this mess of triplicate forms and doing this and sure. doing that. 
and I yeah. didn't get to teach. I would sit with a student. I would Did go you have to write your own syllabus and create your oh, own. No, I, no I, I, I could write, help write the projects, but no, if I went in for say three hours and say I had um, say 25 students. So if you think about that, I can't do the maths, but at the same time, I ended up sitting with each student for about eight minutes and I had to write down what I was saying to them and what mm. they were trying to me and make recommendations. Really? That, that much writing? That's, wow. that's, all, that's all they saw. I taught here in San Francisco at the Academy of Art University um, and, you know, I created the syllabus and I'd have a midterm and a final, but that was about it. You know, I mean, there was a this, few. This was degree courses are far more. When it was before, it was what's called nature and higher national diploma course. And we had fun. But the thing was that things got so um, political and there were so many more people brought in on various hierarchies that just destroyed the, in my eyes, destroyed the course. Yeah. I was actually, Dang. I was actually just shocked. Um, when I used to stay in London, and if I was going home that night, I would get a late train because it was cheaper. So I'd get the 9.30 train. So the course finished at say four in the afternoon. The college stayed up until seven or eight o'clock. And I used to hang around and chat to students and help them with things. Oh, that's they wonderful. Take the later train, the college, right. They actually asked me to stop doing it. Because what? they said you're not, you're you not contracted. Yeah, they, they oh said you're not God. contracted. And right. if you sort of like then, unless you go in that you, I could do it if I went in and then said to everybody, I'm here and spread my time equally because I could get complaints from students that I was then helping one person too much or whatever. Oh my God. Right, I right. Used to have my when I started, it was great fun. I was there. I was there. I didn't want to leave in the evening. Yeah. It was so much we fun. used to have independent studies with some students and yeah. I'd give them all kinds of time. Yeah. yeah. And yet they wouldn't let me. Wow. They, I even got told off because the students once came to me and said, look, Jeff, if we paid for you personally, would you actually, could you come in for an extra day, sort of like we pay for you? And apparently got back to the chief of the office and they, they shouted that. They said, you cannot discuss that. And I said, I didn't discuss it. I said, but you go and talk to them about it. Thank you for the, the compliment, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. And I, yeah, you should have just hung up your own sheet with like, you know, like <laughs> So it got to the point where it was, Neil, I was spending more Neil money going to courses. Teach Neil teaches private courses. You know, Stuart yeah. Gray teaches private courses. Yeah. You should have done that, you know. But Neil's, I mean, Neil's involved with his courses, but also with um, Bachelor of Arts degree courses in various universities as well. Oh, wow. Okay. So the thing is, I mean, that's, I think Neil's actually sort of gotten into it in a, a, a far more on the teaching side because he really, really likes it. I, I went, I, I, I will not be ashamed of it. I went on a big help to a ton of people, I tell you. That me, me, one. I, I, I didn't, I'd never done any silicon makeups as such. So I went on one, on one of his one day silicon makeup courses and he got me on specially. So one person dropped out and he said, look, we'll jump the queue for you and get you on. And I spent a day there learning how to make and, and apply silicon makeups to do a TV show, a one day shoot on a TV show that I did. So it's just sort of, you know, he's helped me a lot as well. Awesome, that is so cool. I, I, so nice I met him, he came here to California yeah. and I met him at the International Makeup Artist Trade Show and he brought his crew with him and we went out drinking and oh, he was wonderful. And he's a nice I bought partner. all his DVD set, you know, like all of the, how to do the, the all the full silicone prosthetics, yeah. you know. But he's, he's, he's actually, he really wants to pass it on with the magazine, with the DVC. Yeah, the prosthetics and the magazine. It's just bug, amazing. Bug. What he's, he's, <laughs> he's doing what we all said we did in the day. We share stuff. We don't, you know, people talk yeah, to each other. Yeah, yeah. He's we'll carrying on the that, this happens, you know. yeah. the Dick Smith tradition. Yeah, totally. So now you're retired and are you still for your own enjoyment? Do you still paint, sculpt anything? I mean, I've looked at uh, a little John, <laughs> I call him little John, John Cormick and Instagram. He does these yeah. amazing sculptures all the yeah. time. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, it's artist, so beautiful. Have I, you like been... I like painting and decorating, but um... mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. I, I, and I, gardening. I, like this, but I, I, I was, I, I just I, I am sort of like quite down on myself on that is the thing is that I yeah I've got a degree I've got an A level um, etc and I, I just I think I was the, I was in the right place at the right time especially with Hellraiser etc but yeah. the thing is that I I would never consider myself a, a good artist so to speak I've done stuff oh come now yeah yeah I think um, fan, just, I, I, I think that everybody not, not for a second is is going to disagree <laughs> but you put me next, I you put disagree. Me next to disagree. <laughs> Yeah. Put me next to John if I'd stayed in it, perhaps who knows? I might have gotten better, who knows? But I just got um there was a sort of a point in the life where it just became it became not nasty, but it became upsetting, it became sort of like trivial and it just it ch it changed. Mm -hmm. You made a big mark. You made a big mark. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 
Oh no, I, I spent three hours like this. I spent three hours in my living room last, hang on, where are we? Last December, um, being interviewed with two camera crew guys from the States for a documentary that Mark Showstrom is producing. Oh, yeah. really? oh He's doing an eight series of um, 80s horror icons, of which wow. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's wow. great. So they do it, so they stay interviewed for two hours <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we ended up talking so long. I mean, thank you so much for <laughs> yeah. for spending That's so right. much time That's with right. us. This is I've always wanted to be able to talk to you like this and get to know a little bit more yeah. about you. And I've always you know, Ryan. wanted to meet you. I've, I've yeah. read about you. From, I mean, I'm 60. I'm almost your same age. And I have a very similar background and, and you know, situation that you yeah. and I just I'm such a big fan of yours. I've I'm thank really you. enjoyed this. Thank you. No, so it's much. just. I, I, I've always said to people, I said, it would be extremely arrogant of me to simply sort of go to people, oh, pish, you know, you're just a fan or whatever, et cetera, things like that. I know that the one thing, my contribution to horror film history is reasonably large. You know, he's, he's, he's in the top, possibly the top 20, possibly here, here. the top 20 horror <laughs> film yeah. icons. Yeah. He's in the same sentence as Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger yes. and that kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. So it, it would be it would be nasty of me to sort of like to say to people, "Oh, don't shut up! You're being silly and childish." So I won't, you know. And I'm very grateful for it. And as Andy Warhol said, "That's my 15 minutes," you know. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's like stuff like that, you know. So it's just, you know. But I, I, I'm glad it happened. I'm glad it did. And it's certainly sort of like bought me the houses I've got or had or whatever. And, and <laughs> yeah. Really Squeeze well. an it's, hour it's, into your 15 minutes. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. And you see, you know, I look back on it and, you know, I think most of us agree. Good time. Back, right? so Good it was time. the best of our lives. We were, we were kids having fun. Yeah, we were early to the early mid-20s. Having a laugh. <laughs> well, yeah i mean you think that, about what it means to people like us right i mean we've been yeah. working on this podcast for almost 10 years 10 years, years. Yeah. yeah you guys are yeah. 10 years yeah. and look at yeah. all the films you know, they made they made nine ten films in this series you know yeah, yeah. Crazy. But, I mean, crazy. It, was, it was fun that was the main thing and, and that, that's when you get the best stuff when when it's fun dr terra yeah. pinhead no i breed to a reasonable degree etc when projects are fun that's when you get the best work and they're making that new stuff for Hellraiser right now. And did you know that, you, did you watch RuPaul's Drag Race? Are you familiar with that? I saw the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Gottmik, the, yeah. the, the drag queen who, uh, who yeah. dressed up as Pinhead, yeah. recently got auditioned uh, uh, for Pinhead for the Hulu Hellraiser movie. So they're, yeah. they're, yeah, this, they're putting that stuff. Talking about this is news. Yeah. 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 Anyway. I, I'm, I'm one of those kind of people, the thing is that it's sort of like, it's, it's the law of diminishing quality, so to speak. I mean, oh, sure. with, the, with the Hellraiser yeah. films. Like yeah. The yeah. Films. Well, and, just, we, we, and there are two consecutive Hellraiser things coming going on at the same time. Yeah. We don't it's, know it's how just, they're going to turn out. I hope they work because the thing yeah. is, it's, it's, I mean, Clive's full of ideas. I, and I, I will read. I think somebody said the the the, the book, the the, the Scarlet the Gospels. Yeah, which I really, really should read because that's the end of Pinhead, so to speak. But the thing is that uh, it, it's. I just sort of think, you know, he's 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 done his bit. Let's carry on. Let's do something. You know, there's so many more stories in the in the Hellraiser universe, that kind of thing, or the Nightmare. or even yeah. Damnation yeah. Game, like you were saying. Yeah, you know, nobody's totally. getting that into a movie yet. Well, they've tried. But people people don't try to make yeah. original movies these days, yeah. so that's the problem. Yeah, that's true. That's very good. Well, once again, thank you so much for that. And I, the the students you've had will go on to become a new generation that will work in TV and movies. <laughs> and uh, if you look up London Fashion College, Jeff Portis, you'll find some students on their blogs and personal websites uh, saying how they're proud to have had you as a teacher and oh, how, I, how, I how much fun that was. I films all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Lots, lots of Mark Julio's people are ex-students of mine. Mm -hmm. um, who just sort of got, you know, who I love to teach them, man, right? inspiring yeah. people, you know, chatting and getting excited with people who get excited about the same things. So maybe so there will be some people. some part of the generation that will have the 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 patience to watch a werewolf, you know, transform. <laughs> transform. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and hey, you know, old you know. is new, you know, like people rediscover. We yeah. what, how do they say uh, we come back around you know come, come you know. well you never know i mean the the, the latest yeah. star Wars movies had a lot of practical effects and marionettes yeah. and puppets and stuff like that so that yeah, does make Baby a difference Yoda was was practical sure yeah. Yeah. yeah do you know the story about that uh Werner herzog he was in the the mandalorian mm -hmm. an and actor. and yeah. at one point the producers were thinking about replacing baby yoda or the child with cgi and i'm, I'm going to do my best Werner herzog uh impression here he said 
the the Muppet is uh, the, the puppet is beautiful. Don't be cowards. And, and they kept him as a as a as yeah. a physical uh, effect yeah. because it just has so much character. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Tony anyway. McVeigh, I believe, sculpted that design, and he lives here in San Francisco. He's responsible for a lot of cool stuff, oh, cool, like cool. salacious crumb, and he did yeah. the baboon for Ray Harryhausen. He did the walrus for Ray Harryhausen. He worked That's awesome. On, you know, a lot of, like Howard the Duck. Oh. He worked on all kinds of stuff. But uh, I wanted to ask you one real quick question, Jeff, before you go, yeah. um, about Hellraiser 3. Did you have anything to do with the pinhead makeup on that? And if no. not, what can you tell us? Did they change that, you know, to your knowledge? How did no, they? Um, right. Um, the, the only things I know about Hellraiser 3 was, I think it was Paul Jones did it. Um, I know um, uh, when Bob said, to, uh, I'd left Image Animation, Bob said to Doug, um, who do you want to do your makeup? Because Doug knew half the crew. And he said, me. And I said, Jeff. Uh, and he said, well, I think, you know, that's not going to be possible. So I think um, I'm pretty, pretty certain it was Paul Jones who did it. Mm. Um, as far as I know, he did pretty much the same thing. I think he looked at the original pictures. I think, I think when uh, Gary Tunnicliffe started doing it in some of the later ones, um, even on Doug, I think he went slightly awry in terms of the sort of like the shapes um, that were on the face. But, you know, I'm not that bothered about it. It's, it's, sure. you know, it's, it he yeah. did it. Um, and it, there was an awful one that he directed with a guy who looked nothing like Doug with the jaw. Oh, and stuff yeah. Like yeah. And then I oh, see the, yeah. the yeah. newest one. Uh, is it Judgment? Is the latest judgment, one? Yes. Yeah, yeah Judgment. That, was, Paul that Taylor. was quite a nice makeup. That's actually caught Doug because they actually got an actor who had a reasonable Doug look to him. That's right. Yeah. Paul Taylor. Um, yeah. so have you before. seen Judgment, that film? No. 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 I stopped watching. I watched three. I've seen, I think, I've seen a bit of the one that's got Craig Sheffer in. Which one's that? Uh, uh, in, Inferno, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the yeah. fifth yeah. one. Yeah. Bloody awful. So, so no <laughs> pinhead in space for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, okay. Well, once again, <laughs> you know, you look on number three, that pillar of souls that Paul Catling did was just a work of art. Yeah, that um, was really yeah. nice. I have some original yeah. drawings so, of that that Paul yeah. Catling did. I'd love to get in touch with him. Wow, Paul, yeah. if you're out there, please contact us. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you get in touch with uh, Mark Coulier, um, I think Paul's been doing some work with Mark Coulier recently. Okay, okay, I'm pretty wow. sure he's still working. He's still working. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Well, I hope you have a great tea or dinner or uh, with Roy. Yes, yeah, yeah, a and, wonderful uh, Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I props to Roy because he also did production assistant work in uh, Nightbreed. Yeah, loads of something. Yeah, yeah, he ran the office. He, you know, yeah, yeah. that was it. He sat yeah, there yeah. behind his desk, etc., and, and then sort of like occasionally signed a check for. And did he assist you? You said on Ch Chenard? Yeah, yeah, he was. He was. He was my. He was my makeup assistant on all the whole on both Hellraiser films and on Night and on Nightbreed as well. Wow. So props to Roy. <laughs> thank you, Roy. Thank you. No, no, he's, he's a brilliant organizer. So, you know. All right. Well, thank you so much. This yeah, was the, uh, this was the fun. episode with Jeff Portis. We Great should have done pleasure. this sooner. Yeah. 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 yeah we, had Doug. we had Doug last time. Now we have you. It's like, wow, bookends. <laughs> yeah. We'll do another one. I'm sure there's five million things I haven't talked about, and I can talk the hind legs of a donkey, as the saying goes. So. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love would to have great. you and yeah. like the Atkins come on and talk about like nice. Yeah, yeah. Nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. I said, so. I still speak to Pete and Tony Randall in the States as well. Again, when we come over to the States, I'll, I'll come over and see you, Ed, if we ever get over to San Francisco. Oh, that'd we'd be like, wonderful. We would love to get over to Tony Randall, Randall as well, you know, so it's just sort of, it was just, it'd be nice to see. And uh, Martin Mercer lives over there. He's a storyboard yes, artist. Yes, yes. I want to get him to be interviewed too. I've been in touch he's with a, him. He's a lovely man. He's a lovely man. And he's a brilliant artist as well. He's so and great. He, I met him on Waxworks he, too. I, Bob yeah. Keith, those guys were in LA yeah. and I got to go on set and help them a little bit. Getting to, get to tell you some of the Nightbreed stories of the tricks we played on him. So that's all fun. Yeah, he did Vasty Moses too. Uh, no, Little John did Vasty Moses. Yeah. Um, uh, I think he had a part in, we basically then took the Vasty Moses body and reconfigured it for the guys on stilts. Oh, that's what Martin oh. did. Work that on. was what Martin did, yeah. yeah. But he also, he designed and built the Berserkers as well. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. The suits, yeah, yeah, the suits. Yeah. I, th I think uh, um, Paul Jones sculpted the berserker face. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Jones. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was him and Martin who sort of like were the main sort of like thing behind them. Actually, you might be right there. Might be Paul as well. Hmm. And then Nick Vince played yeah. one of them. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I was, 
those suits were disgusting. I mean, sort of like they were full of sweat. Because they were all sweaty, sweaty right? Sweaty and right. gross. Really full of methyl cell and blood. Yes. Hey, maybe, maybe we can find more questions for Nightbreed for the for the next episode oh, yeah, and then yeah. we can have him back. Thank um, you. Yeah. yeah. We well, we're going to let you go, Jeff. Thank you so much Thank again you. for being with us. And this podcast, Having No Beginning, will have no end. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Watch for our annual Kickstarter fundraisers to get some cool stuff, and you can buy t-shirts on our TeePublic store. Go to TeePublic.com and search for BarkerCast. Thanks for listening.